we're going to call call the meeting to order. We're actually going to change the format a little bit here tonight, um, much like um, when we meet for the Copley Trust Board. We've decided to change the format. Whenever we have a, a liquor or tobacco license, whenever we've had that in the past, we've always broken out partway down through our agenda and voted to go into that uh, liquor control board. But from now on, uh, from right now, we're going to try going right into the liquor control board at the beginning of the meeting, just like we do, like I said, when we have a Copley Trust. And so having said that, I'm going to call the meeting of the cop of the, yeah, the Copley, the, the, the alcohol board um, to order. And first on the agenda, there are liquor, liquor license applications. Sarah, do you want to start with that? Sure, there's um, four liquor license renewals, Cumberland Farms, uh, two for RL Valley at their two different locations, and Slim Point, which is um, okay. down here in the valley. Riverbend. 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 Riverbend Market. Jason, have you looked at these? I did. No issues. Uh, okay. All right. Do I hear, these are just renewals? Just renewals. Do I hear a motion regarding these? Make a motion to approve the license renewals. Do I do we name all of them? Just, just as of the as four as that are written in our agenda um, for approval for liquor license. All right, I have a motion by Judy. Is there a second? Second, second? second by Don. Any further discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion is passed. <clears throat> now we have tobacco license applications. So there's five renewals. Um, I don't know if you guys remember me telling you, we now um, have to locally <coughs> approve tobacco licenses. Uh, we hadn't for a long time, but the state reread the law and realized that they do have to be approved locally. So um, these are for big intelli intelligence group LLC, which is 10 Road, uh, 10 Road, 10 Railroad, Cumberland Farms, RL Valley, both locations, and Slim Point. What is Slim Point again? Slim Point is um, Riverbend Market. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. And um, in your packet, there's also brand new, there's not only tobacco licenses, but there's uh, tobacco substitute endorsements, and that's the vaping paraphernalia. Okay. Um, so this doesn't have to do with uh, with uh, it's not cannabis. Not, not cannabis. cannabis. Not this time, but it could. Cannabis is, well, no, cannabis is all done through the state. So um, we have not formed a local cannabis control board. So they won't come before us then. Okay. All right. So do I hear a motion regarding these licenses? Make a motion. We approve the tobacco license renewal that appear on our agenda. Okay, I have a motion by Judy. Do I have a second? I'll oh, second. <laughs> second by Don. <clears throat> Is there any further discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion is passed unanimously. Do I hear a motion to adjourn from the alcohol board? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So now I uh, will call the select board meeting to order. Oh, and just a couple of notes. Um, Jess is going to join us a little bit later. But I wanted to remind folks to, um, if they want to speak tonight, and you're certainly welcome to, to come forward to the microphone. And we've noticed we, we've had quite a bit of feedback about folks that are listening on Zoom. They oftentimes can't hear people that are trying to speak and what they say it echoes a lot. So if you can be fairly close to the microphone, either put your head down to it or whatever. And um, the main thing is, you know, say your name, where you're from, and um, speak very uh, clearly for the folks out in Zoom land. Um, the other thing is I really like to have everybody be respectful and, um, and only direct comments to our board or to me. And don't, don't talk to anybody else. Um, if you're making, making a, um, some sort of concern, direct it toward the board. Don't single out anybody that's in the meeting. That's um, just be, be respectful of everybody. So having said that, thank you very much. Um, so Eric, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? None. None? All right, we'll do first approve the minutes. 
Uh, the minutes of 11723. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of 11723. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Don and a second by Judy. Is there further discussion on these minutes? Yes, just a couple of minor things on page three. Mm -hmm. Page three of the packet, page two of the minutes. Yep. Just note that I did attend by Zoom. Oh, yeah. And okay. then on page seven, that I left the meeting at 9.05. Okay. All right. Is there any other discussion on these minutes? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are passed. Now the minutes of 126.23. Make a motion to pass it. Second. I have a motion by Judy and a second by Brian. Or no, a motion by Brian and a second by Judy. <clears throat> Is there any further discussion on these motions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are passed. Now one more set of minutes, the minutes of 130.23. I'll make a motion we accept the minutes of 130.23. All right, I have a motion by Don. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Judy. Is there any further discussion about these minutes? Yes. Um, administration and staff should read that Eric attended, Judy attended, and Sarah Haskins attended, rather than what it does say. Okay. And for participants and guests, our minutes have nobody but Tom Cloutier was there, Dave Ring was there, Sheila Tarbox, Travis Sabatano, Laura Streets, Tony Cody, and Barry Russo were all there. Okay. Thank you. I had Any help. further discussion on these minutes? <coughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are passed. <coughs> Moving on to new business. Number one, review the 21-22 audit for the auditors. They should be on Zoom. John Mudgett here. I'm uh, I'm on Zoom. Welcome, John. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks for inviting us. Absolutely. Do you have any comments about the audit? I have a couple, and. Uh, I'm looking to see if Bonnie, oh, there's Bonnie. Bonnie yep. Dow uh, has joined us now. Yep, Bonnie, uh, was, well. Bonnie, of course, was the lead auditor on, uh, on your audit. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and to make some comments. But uh, uh, when it comes down to any tough questions, I'm, of course, going to defer to Bonnie. And, <laughs> and the reason we, uh, we appreciate your inviting us tonight is not so that we can talk to you so much as we can give the board an opportunity to ask us any questions they might like to ask or to uh, have uh, uh, comments uh, about the audit uh, reports that we've issued for you. You've had them for quite a while now, so I'm sure you've all uh, uh, marked up the, uh, the uh, reports and have lots of things you'd like to talk about. So I won't, um, I'll make this brief. Uh, we did uh, uh, do audit planning in the spring. Then we uh, conducted most of the audit work in, in September. Uh, Tina and her staff, of course, were very well prepared for the audit. So it went quite smoothly this year. Very few adjustments. As you know from the, uh, from the uh, looking at the financial statements, your funds are in pretty good uh, shape. You have uh, 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 net position or equity balances that are that are generally quite positive and in good shape. I did uh, I did uh, notice in uh, looking quickly at our audit report. I, I sometimes forget to mention this, but uh, the financial statements, of course, are are your statements. Uh, there are two auditors' reports in the package, and one of them is on page one and runs for three pages. Uh, the second one is right at the end and addresses uh, internal control and compliance. So that's back on page 46. 
Uh, the uh, the one on page that begins up front, the report on the financial statements, looks a little different this year than it did the previous year. Uh, that's because the uh, the uh, folks that govern auditing standards for governmental uh, audits uh, came up with some additional uh, phrasing they thought ought to be there, and they changed the order of uh, the financial statement audit report. Uh, it uh, gets to the same place in the end, though, and that is an unmodified report, which says that your financial statements uh, present fairly the uh, financial position and results of operations of the town of Morristown. Uh, there were no findings or comments that uh, the auditors wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, that that's a good thing because it means that uh, that it uh, was a uh, that, that that they believe your systems are very good and that the results of the uh, accounting procedures produced good financial statements. We made very few adjusting entries. We call it proposing audit adjustments. And uh, the ones that we did propose were accepted by the town and are reflected in the uh, financial statements. Uh, okay. I, uh, I'll throw it open to the board or to uh, Bonnie if she wants to add any comments or, uh, or, or uh, pick up on anything that I may have misspoken. Bonnie, you have any comments? Yeah, I don't think I have anything um, that specific to add other than it was a pleasure to work with Tina again this year and she was very prepared when I arrived and it went pretty smoothly. Um, more if you guys have any questions as you guys reviewed it, we're happy to answer them for you. Yeah, I, I uh, was looking at this and, you know, what always comes to my mind is uh, a way, if there's anything we could be doing where it would show more transparency in what we're doing. And I always ask that and I always think about fraud. You know, you, you, you hear um, towns that have embezzlements happen and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it seems like the way we're set up, we're very protected from that. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting there might be, but is there any recommendation you, you folks might have for us? I know oftentimes, like, like I believe you said that, uh, John about uh, some recommendations for us and um, I like you said I, I didn't see any with this one and um, so me maybe it means we're squeaky clean but there's always room for improvement and is there anything we could do to do a better job um, during the year um, Tina definitely doesn't hesitate to reach out to me and ask questions if there's something new or different or if they're thinking about changing a procedure or something new is being implemented to make sure they're considering all the right sides of things to make sure that they're implementing proper controls. Um, Tina has reached out at me a couple of times over the past year or so um, with questions on like the new ARPA funding to make sure that's being handled correctly um, and other questions as they may come up. So I definitely think you guys are in a good place with your internal controls. Um, if I did have anything to recommend that I picked up on during the audit, it didn't rise to the level of it being a written finding in your report. Um, and Tina and I would have discussed it while I was there during the audit. Um, and I don't even recall anything that significant coming up while we were looking at things um, other than the, um, the ARPA grant fund having a deficit. We did discuss that towards the end. Um, the ARPA grant was funded in advance. They gave you a bunch of it up front. You guys may have started spending it now during this fiscal year, um, but it was invested and the investment account did take some losses by June 30th of 22, um, which could be a concern. Um, maybe look at how grant funds are invested if they're advancing you things so that you guys aren't on the hook to recover that if the market doesn't rebound. Um, but I do think Tina's already kind of addressed that um, this year because we did discuss that quite a bit at the end of the audit. Well, that sounds good. It, it um, it's occurs to me that one of the reasons we don't have anything that sticks out is because it's a credit to Tina and the job that she does with, with the town. 
and um, can't say enough about that. You know, I know I've heard from other auditors in the past. They say the same thing. They they find it very nice to work with with our finance department, and um, this is a bravo, kudos, Tina. Um, also, the town clerk's office yeah. is a big help too. I mean, they do quite a bit. If they didn't do a good job, they do. We wouldn't have the audit we have. So that's, I, that's not just my office. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Tina. Any other comments? No, oh, I'm good. No. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. I think um, I think we have what we need. I will add one more thing before we uh, uh, part. Uh, please don't uh, think of this just uh, as a uh, once a year uh, thing. Uh, although Tina and uh, Bonnie do communicate during the year, uh, the board or, or through the board chair, feel free to reach out if, if you have questions during the year. Uh, we're really here for you uh, uh, year round, so. That sounds good. Thanks a lot, John, and thanks, Bonnie. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Hi, Jess. Hi. How's it going? So, All right. So, <laughs> when we've done that, we'll we'll move to number two of new business. Appoint either Christy Sniff or Donnie Blake to the open DRB seat. How do we want to do that, Todd? Do you want to talk about that or? Sure. Let's do page number five or so, let me see one. Is it the rules of procedure? The rules of procedure, yes. So rules of procedure, page 10 of your package, item number four details how uh, appointments are done. I think we're handling DRV first. And what this says, the, the fourth line down number four is vacancy should be filled by alternates wishing to fill the seat. We have two of those, uh, Christy and Donnie. Uh, Christy has been on as an alternate longer. <coughs> Uh, Christy was appointed as the uh, select board, sorry, the trustee choice for the open DRBC at the last trustee meeting. So the select board either has to appoint Christy or Donnie. If you appoint Christy, you perfect the appointment and Christy is the full-time member and will look to backfill a new member. If you choose Donnie instead, the select board and trustees have to work amongst themselves to select a candidate and move forward with one candidate going forward, basically with the stalemate. So hopefully we can help with the candidates tonight. And works to uh, resolve the open seat in the DRB. Okay. This is Laura Street's seat with Don. Would you mind um, um, listing the folks that are currently serving on the DRB? Gary might be helping on that one. I saw Gary. Oh, Gary. Uh, Chair Nolan is here. Gary, Paul Trudell, Chris Wilshire, Marianne Wilson, Melissa LeBlanc, uh, Susanna Burnham. Who am I missing? missing somebody. Oh, the open seat. Uh, Laura. Yeah, Laura, 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 Laura stepped down. You have. Uh, the alternates right now, the two alternates, we're allowed to have, they're Christy and Donnie, so you're selecting one of the alternates. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, before you go. Yeah. <laughs> Stay there. So, if we select Christy, would Donnie stay on as an alternate? Donnie will stay on the alternate, yes. Okay. But if we select Donnie, then we have an arm wrestle with the trustees? Yes. Okay. As you put it. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. So if you select Donnie, no appointment is made uh, because you couldn't agree on a candidate. You'll have to have a joint meeting with the trustees and try to work out why Christie versus Donnie or vice versa. Given that we seemingly have two very good candidates for this seat on the DRB, is there a is there a, any kind of a history or precedent in who to choose based upon the experience and time that they've already put into the DRB? The new policy is silent as to uh, experience, credentials. I think it's up for the board to weigh. Uh, in, in the past, generally, it doesn't mean it has to be uh, obviously continued. The, there seems to be a succession policy where the person with most seniority is usually looked at first, and that would be Christy tonight. But it's not written there. You're not weighed for that by any means. And how many years have these individuals been alternates? Christy probably. Two to three, Donnie maybe a year, a year and a half, somewhere on there. Okay. Both good candidates and both would make good board members. Is there a recommendation from the DRB? That, that's how that happens sometimes? No, the, uh, as you'll get to the next agenda item of a planning council appointment, the select board has to choose between the alternates. Uh, when you have an open seat, you get a recommendation. So the D, once you fill the alternate seat, once you fill the full-time seat, 
the DRB is going to interview alternates on February 22nd and recommend, just like the Planning Council for the next event item has recommended a candidate. But the recommendation comes for an open seat, not when there's alternates. When there's alternates, you have to choose one for the policy. Okay. It's like a King Solomon decision. Good yes. to know. Yeah, I imagine it would be hard for the board to pick amongst its members itself, so that's why you guys get the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. All right. How do you feel? <clears throat> like I said, there's two really good candidates here. I, Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Cloutier. You have to get closer to my microphone. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Tom Cloutier. I'm from Marshall. And this is nothing at all to these folks here. I want you to know. I don't know them personally. I don't know them. Don't you? A black person. Uh, the things that I do know is, is that, uh, and I'd be saying this if it was Joseph and Mother Mary sitting there. I'd still be saying the same thing. So please don't take this in any way uh, other than what you know. Uh, Tom is, a, is the chairman of, of the uh, uh, trustees, and he also sits on uh, the, the uh, planning council. And uh, uh, what we're going to have now, if you will uh, allow Christy on the DRB, you've got the same family on three or four boards. Uh, not, not that they were do anything wrong, but I'll tell you what, it certainly gives the, the perception of a conflict of interest there. And, I, and I'll read you it from, from the uh, Vermont League uh, of Cities and Towns, their, their, their take on this. And it's the uh, how to address the conflict of interest. In addition, they say, to the statutory requirements mentioned, there are also political, legal, and reputational interests at stake. Failure to manage ethical dilemmas appropriately can significantly damage the reputation of a local official or uh, entire public body or the municipality itself. Within the context of local government, a perceived conflict of interest can be just as problematic as a real conflict. We know these folks, and we know their August is a day's long. Somebody comes in front of their board, they don't know that. What they know is there's the chairman of one board, very important trustee board, also sitting on a, a board for the town of Morristown, and his wife sitting on a very, very important DFB board. Now maybe years before, when there weren't very many people looking to work for the town government, that might be okay. But today we've got many people. Donnie Blake, for one. Excellent choice. Not you know, but Donnie would be an excellent choice. And so and Christie would still be an alternative. That is something you should probably strongly, strongly do, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, I, you know, I, I will say thank you, Tom. I, I, I don't disagree with what you've said, and since I've come on the board, there's been this kind of discussion has taken place. Okay. Took took place last spring when I first came on about people sitting on different boards, certainly, um, and you know the fact that we do have multiple candidates for this position kind of throws more weight on what you're saying. I, 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 I wish I didn't have to make this decision because yeah. uh, it's just, it's, it's tough, but uh, I think having diversities of opinions on different boards is probably a good thing. It's probably a good thing for our town. I'm looking at it a little differently. Christy's her own person. She's not in a, an appendage of her husband. She can make her own decisions. Um, and, Just uh, ask Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd rather look at these people individually and not as uh, someone 
representing their spouse. Okay. Jess? Um, I, um, I agree with, with what Judy is saying, um, and I also um, am hearing what um, Tom is um, saying as well about um, a potential conflict of interest. And I also see that potential um, with, with um, Donnie Blake being a, a builder. Um, so, I mean, there's, it's a small town. There's a lot of potential for conflicts of interest. I, um, <clears throat> that is one thing that does concern me. We do have a lot of people in the building trades or um, in, um, as developers on the DRB, um, which concerns me. So um, I would be leaning um, more towards Christy. Right. I agree with what Judy said too because it's a small town and unless there's proof or even uh, somebody wants to step forward with some information that there is, I don't think we should turn down people that have worked hard for the town over the years. So. And I, what Tom said, I've been over and over and over it. For a while my wife served on the planning council. And there was those that said, oh, you know, that's not good, you know, that's a conflict. I even went, went and saw an attorney about it, an attorney that, that is an attorney for Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And, um, and he said, well, in a small town, you don't very often have that many people that, are, that rise to serve in these positions. And granted, this time we have two, um, but it's not like we have 20, you know, it's not like a big town where you wouldn't even have that happen. In small towns, it's very common, and and um, the attorney said to me, he said, well, if it seems like, a, if it's perceived that it could be a conflict, then maybe it is, but you've got to feel like it is yourself. If you don't feel it's a conflict, then you shouldn't worry about it. In a small town, it's very common to have, you know, the, the wear of many hats all around town, you know, and um, those are people that are, want to get involved. And But having said that, I... I like the idea of not having the potential for conflict, you know. Um, I know Christy and I know Tom and I'm not worried one bit about any kind of conflict with anything that they might do. They're both independent people and I trust that. Um, but, uh, but also, like, I, I know Donnie really well too and he would be excellent at serving. I, I think there's no doubt everybody on this board feels that they're both alternates now. They both can serve, serve the position quite well. Um, but maybe I think I lean more toward Donnie because we, then we wouldn't we wouldn't have that. Nobody could say, "Oh well, you know, Tom's the chair of the trustees, and he's also on the planning commission, and his wife's on the DRB." You're going to hear that, you know. And why not do away with it? That's a big big reason my wife got off the planning board because she would have people just like all after her all the time. She goes, "It's not worth it," you know. Doing stuff for the town, there's always going to be people yakking at you about stuff, and it's true. Unfortunately, it's true. But so that's that's my two cents about it. You have a hand up on Zoom. Marianne Wilson. Go ahead, Marianne. Um, I would like to uh, just put my two cents in. Uh, having sat on the DRB, um, both Donnie and Christy are great uh, alternates. But I will say, uh, Christy is very very thoughtful and certainly uh, engaged in the community. But. It's really good having someone with Donnie's expertise on the board because we're facing a lot of these, uh, you know, the growing housing questions. And uh, I, I would like to say that I would support Donnie and, and keep Christy as an alternate for sure. Here's a question for, for either of you. If, if we choose the other one, are you happy to still serve as an alternate? I mean, if I have a conflict as a board member, why don't I have a conflict as an alternate? And if you don't want me because you have a perceived, I have a perceived conflict, then right. why would you want me as right. an alternate? Yeah. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to get the seat that's open. I'm in the history right. is that the most senior alternate is appointed to the seat. I mean, if I have a conflict, it shouldn't be an alternate, right? Right. Well, and if you have I don't a, think that I have a conflict. If you have a conflict, you can recuse yourself, and that's that's what we went through many times when Gary was Gary's on the board, and he worked for Minosh Company for 40 years. You know, every time Harold Minosh had a project, people would say, "Oh, you know, Gary shouldn't be deciding on that." Well, he never did. 
he recused himself on any decision that had anything to do with the Menashe project. And the same with Paul Trudell. Paul Trudell does lots of work around town, and same thing. He's recused himself. And um, I think it's being done correctly. Um, but this is just for discussion, you know, how, how you folks feel. In the end, it's going to be a, a vote here. Yeah. I think both, I mean, I know both of these people, and I think they're very highly qualified. I would tend to go for Christy only because Christy has served longer. And that's what I base my, my judgment on. Okay. Donnie. I thought I'd make it a little bit easier. Come right up here, buddy. So if you ask the question, you know, would, whichever one of us gets it, would you have to stay out of the, as an alder? I certainly would. I want the spot, yeah. I mean, just as much as Chrissy does. But I know if I was in her spot and I already did three years and the other guys only got one year in, I would expect some tender there. So I just want you to know that if Chrissy's the one today, I'm going to still be here on DRB. So as an alternate. That's great to hear. And then when another spot opens up, I'll go for the full spot. Thanks, Donnie. Thank you, Donnie. Thanks, Donnie. You looking for a motion? Yeah, we are. Go ahead, one more time. Not a, not a 10 minute one, please. <laughs> Chris, we'll make a super, uh, you know, board member of the DRB. I don't want anybody to think that I think any different than that. Uh, I, I have this, as you all know, serving on multiple boards to me is not correct. And I'll, I'll keep saying that forever. I don't think it's correct for Tom to be on both of them. He does a great job. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he does it. I don't think that he's any problem with, with that. It, to me, it's just the perceived, which is a big problem, is the perceived conflict. That's what we're talking about. Not that they have it. And Christy, if you can put it right there, that, that's fine with me. And I know Donnie will do wonderful at, on the alternate. And if, if it's reversed, it, it's the same. Yep. I just don't want anybody to think that I, I think that anything's wrong with those folks, because I certainly don't. Okay. And, and in this case, Christy is would only be on one board, correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm ready to make a motion. <coughs> okay. Go for it. I'll make a motion. We uh, appoint Christy Snip to the DRB. I'll second. I have a motion by Don and a second by Jess. Is there any further discussion on this? I, I just want to say this. You know. It's been a few tough decisions, and this is a real tough one. And thank you for your comments, and thank you. thank you as well for all the work you've done. Etienne has his hand up. Uh, Do you have your hand up, or you just? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I, I only, uh, if the select board were to act on these perceived conflict of interests questions, I would highly recommend that you uh, write these percept these uh, conflict of interests into the policy of serving on boards for the future if you're not going to act on them i mean you still could write in policies but it's an opportunity to address these questions from the public and <clears throat> make sure that it's clear to everyone if there's going to be a rule that uh, two people who cohabitate cannot both serve on public boards uh, that it be explicitly re explicitly written that way. Thanks, Etienne. I don't think that's legal. But. Right. <laughs> that's a slippery slope. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Christy is now full DRB member. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, number three, appoint new planning council member. So as I referenced a couple minutes ago, uh, under the same page 10 of your packet, number four, the last couple sentences. So we have a candidate for open planning council seat. Uh, that is a procedure recommendation from the planning council this year. Mr. McGee uh, is the recommended candidate from the planning council. Mr. McGee's attended, I think, just about every meeting since May. So he's been uh, attending and, and interacting and uh, it's gotten a pretty good primer on what the board does and how the board acts. And you yeah. still want to do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's happy to answer any questions you have, but he is the recommended candidate from the Planning Council. They interviewed um, uh, Mr. McGee and Wally Reed for the seat, and Wally basically said, you have a good candidate. I'm happy to wait for the next one. Thank you. Okay. 
That makes it easy. Yeah. All right. Do I hear a motion regarding this? Make the motion we um, appoint Mr. McGee to the planning council. His, yeah, his name's not on here. Oh, it's, nope. I thought it's on, oh, it's on a letter. Yes. That's right. I think I saw it somewhere. You got to find it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. A motion by Judy. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Brian. Is there any further discussion on this? Hey, Mr. McGee, would you like to tell us? Come up to the microphone and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, put you on the hot seat right now. All right. Yeah, my name is Tim McGee. I bought a house on 380 Brooklyn Street. It was a year past October, um, so I lived here 15 months. But I've been coming here for 10 years since me and my wife got together. She had lived here before, and she really loved it here. And then the more I came here, started liking it more and more. So we decided to buy a house here. And just want to get involved with the change of community and have a part in it. That's great. Thank you. Can I just ask why the planning council? Unlike the last two people that we knew <laughs> fairly well. Why? Because we um, don't know as much back about in you. May or before that, there was, I think it was on front page forum that there was an open seat. And for some reason, me and my wife have been talking about me getting involved in something like that. I talked about it when we lived in Waterbury Center. Um, my uncle was on Ducks, Ducks Board boards. My grandfather was on Waterbury board, so it kind of runs in my family. So I figured maybe I'd give it a shot. Saw that opening, went, didn't get it. So I figured I'd just keep going, learn about it, and show them I was you know, serious about it, and wait for another one to open. Great. Thanks. Excellent. That was good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, All right. Any further discussion on this? <clears throat> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? You are now a planning council member. Mm. Thank you. All right, number four, <clears throat> discuss making Hutchins Street a one way to create new on street parking. This has come up before. Yes. So thank you. I'm. Uh... Before you start, Todd, I wanted to find out if the people on Zoom can hear everyone at the microphone. Is there anyone having yeah. a problem? No problem. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Well, I just saw Josh's name pop up. Josh is one of the parking committee members. I'm here as the staff person to that committee that met uh, about six times over the spring and summer and at Rapids work in the fall. And uh, as you can see on page 13 of your package, page 13 and 14, we're working our way through the implementation plan. Uh, we have two things on the plan tonight. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is making Hutchins Street uh, one way. So uh, in a nutshell, over the last two years, we've seen we can operate without Hutchins Street in the downtown. Traffic has not come to a standstill. Everyone's likes have seemed to be okay. There's been no issues with it. Uh, as the Mall Housing Partnership finishes up their new building there, the new 24 year building, they'll be repaving and fixing the road. And at some point, we have to open it up for traffic again, which will happen this spring or this summer. And it would be good to have an indication now, although we're not formally voting it tonight because it's part of your more vehicle ordinance. It would be good to have an indication of what the road is going to be when it reopens so we can prepare for that. So the proposal in the, from the parking uh, committee is to have a one-way road down the hill. Uh, met with Kevin, uh, Kevin's okay with the one-way down the hill, it's easier to push snow down hill than uphill. That will allow traffic, you're coming from the school. If you want to cut off the intersection, you can still go down Pleasant Street, go down Hutchins, and continue right on to Portland under bridge and go that way. So pretty historic traffic pattern. It will stop, actually, um, people from coming around the museum, coming around the side of the, the uh, Bijou Theater, stopping right there to take that left and blocking up traffic. They can't put a big sight line there. And obviously, the point of the plan is to create on street parking on the side of the street that's being vacated for travel through traffic. So this would allow on street parking along the Nephew building up to a good chunk of the hill of the parking lot. So create more parking spaces for the available downtown with zero cost to the taxpayers other than a few dinner and enter signs and some lane and some lane striping. How many spots? Uh, depends on what the road looks like at the top of the new at the, where the sidewalk is <coughs> at the new building. I would say it's roughly seven, but we'll see. I mean, we could create more of a look into the hillside of the parking lot. I don't want to touch that retaining wall, that little grass retaining wall there. So uh, we'll measure when we get there. But it should be like six or seven spots, I imagine. Would we have any on the other side? No. The other side is mostly uh, used by Tyler Mumma's building, Mumma Engineering for It's got completely open access for parking. And the building itself has got, the new building itself has got two 
uh, lower level parking spots at ground level and back up too. So most of that road is on that side of the road, which is the north side of Hutchins Street, is already used for traffic turning movements. It'd be the south side that would allow right. the one so plane of parking. The one house is on the corner. Yes. That they wouldn't have parking in front of that? They would not. Okay. No. And the park would probably start a little bit down the only opposite side of the street from that house. It'd probably start pretty close to the uh, the new building LHP owns on the other side of the street. So there hasn't been any engineering done or any sketch or anything like that? It's just no, the width of pavement's adequate. So the width of pavement's, uh, even on the, you have a site plan here. Yeah, I see on that. On page 15, that shows the width of Hutchins Street on the narrow end is 22 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, lane of traffic, call it 10, 11 feet. Uh, a, a parallel spot on the side of the road is 7 feet. You get ample room, you still get ample room for a plow truck with a, with a plow on to go down the road with cars parked on one side. If you eliminate one way traffic, if you limit to one way traffic. Obviously it's not. Possible the street parking that's the traffic there. So the okay, past the past has shown us we don't need the two way parking, so hopefully we can create some parking spots at no cost to the taxpayers. Do you want to chime in some more on that? Yeah, uh, Todd and I met today when we looked at the site. Um Come on up closer. Oh sorry. And with looking at what's there on the road, we probably wouldn't be using a plow truck anyway. Right. We'd make it a loader scoop down to and just box it out. Yeah. That way, if we plow it down, it'll all the snow would go into the apartments. So if we just box it out and take it down to Riverhead Corners and leave it there and pick it up with the rest of the snow, then we yeah. scoop out of that area. So you scoop it out. You don't even have to back drag it. You just. Nope. It would just go right down the hill. Hmm. That's great. Any other any other considerations? No, I mean, there'd be a winter parking bench. There'd barely be nobody there in the winter time anyway. All right. So, do you think it's a good thing? I would think so. Yes, because I think when you're coming up out of there, traffic coming up the hill on Pleasant Side is going to be challenging mm -hmm. if there's a lot of traffic coming up mm -hmm. out of there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Well, we certainly need more parking we do. in the village. <coughs> when, you're, when you're talking about the winter ban, you're saying at night they can't. There's a certain right. Places. Just the extended word the winter parking ban. Okay, it's like seven o'clock at night or something. Seven to seven, yeah. Or yeah whatever it is. Seven. Yeah. Okay. Although it's a seven. I don't want to scare you. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <coughs> Although I've got a lot of a lot of friends that say, "When's that apartment house going to be done so I can get my cut through back?" You know, so you don't have to go through the, the center of town. <laughs> well, it'll be one way, right. and there'll be a "Do Not Enter" sign. They want to cut the, the other way. Yes. So we do not enter signs on Portland. As you're looking, as you're looking from the beach to the back of the beach, be, you can see "Do Not yeah. Enter" signs. Mm -hmm. And traffic come down but no traffic, no more traffic. So we're not making any decisions tonight. We're just. Just giving. A, I'm hoping you'll give a clear indication that this is the way we're going to move forward. The formal decision is going to take place. I have here March 20th at the bottom of page 10, but that may be pushed out a couple weeks. That's when we formally adopt the new uh, motor vehicle ordinance. This is part of the motor vehicle ordinance talks about speed limits, parking sides of the street. We talk about Hutchins being one way. So formally, we're not going to take any action until the end of March on this, or maybe April. But it'd be good to have the select board on board so we know that we know to actually order signs to talk to LHP to coordinate with them that the road is going to be uh, one way coming down the hill. Now, is this something we'd have some engineering done, like from Tyler Mumley or somebody, or a highway engineer? So, because they might uncover some considerations we don't even know. <clears throat> I'm not sure what there is to engineer. You're talking about existing pavement. Yeah, we put lines on it. What? There's exactly. no changing. Nope. These are just questions people might ask. Yep, I'm sorry. Bob, you have a question on Zoom as okay. well. Okay, Gary, you first, and then. Yeah, I just want to uh, make a point that I think, Todd, uh, with the traffic going down the hill, you might be able to gain an extra spot going up on the right-hand side so you can park closer to the corner because there won't be any traffic trying to turn to go up the hill. I agree. You know, like tractor trailer or pickup trucks and trailers on them or something like that. So mm -hmm. You might even be able to get one more spot there, right. which would help by having the one way down the hill. Yeah. So, Sounds thank good. Thank you. Kathy, you have your hand up. I do. Um, I just want to say that if heard, um, when you park after the post office anywhere down on the right hand side of the road, um, I do a lot of traveling through the day for work. Um, it's very hard. I was hoping that you would go up the hill because now you have to go all the way down to, um, I, I know it as a station restaurant, and that's very congested in there. 
So when you turn right to go back up to the village um, and anybody coming down the hill cuts that corner and they're always on your side of the road when you turn to go up the hill. So I do agree with Bob that maybe some engineering needs to come in here because you're bringing the traffic down the hill, but anybody that doesn't want to go left after the Bijou to come back to the village has to go through that that path to come back up. Um, and it's very congested there. Um, I, I, you know, do some problems there, but that's my opinion. Thank you. Kathy, they do cut that corner. I've experienced that a lot. Which corner are you on? From the top, they, they're going to cut down on Hutchins Street going down, and they'll, oh, they'll take the, wow. they round the corner there. Yeah. And if you're coming up, and then they look at you like you've done something wrong, and you're right there. Mm -hmm. Um, but Bob, I'm also talking about when they come, instead of coming down Hutching Street um, now, because Hutching is not available, and they go down over the hill and come back out by the restaurant, they right. really that corner a lot. I mean, really bad. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Well, I just have a, a question for Todd first. Um, are you... Is it important that you get consensus from us tonight as to whether it's up or down or just being one way? Is that yeah, enough? I think that's the plan. I mean, this is the, the park company talked about this for many months and this is one of their key recommendations. Um, you have budget constraints, obviously. We can build parking garages, they cost millions of dollars, right. or we can use our existing pavement to house cars during the day at no cost to the taxpayer. Those are the two signs of the bucket of pain. It and seems so, like tonight the important thing is to create a one way to create more parking. Correct. Something that we spent a lot of time back last spring talking about. Correct. And for so. road crew guys, it's obviously easier to push no downhill than uphill. Yeah. And when you do take, if you allow uphill traffic on Hutchins Street again, and not the only way, if you're coming out of Hutchins Street and turning onto Pleasant, let's say you're turning towards MoCo, it's really hard to see people coming up that short yeah. hill from Pleasant yeah. Street. It is. You're gonna have an accident there someday. So this really makes that intersection much safer. Coming up from Ten Railroad, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Someone's up there, and you can't see them until they're on top of you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. someone will get T-boned there someday if we don't. Uh, we can fix. We can. We can solve that potential issue by rerouting the tra traffic down the hill. So stop it. But getting consensus from us tonight that a one-way is a good idea. Yes. Would certainly push things forward. For Correct. Okay. 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 You have other uh, hands up over there. Two questions. Okay. You want to come to the microphone? Yeah. Just one question. There is. There's the bus stop. What's your name, sir? Dave Joseph. And there's the bus stop across from River Arts. Right. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if, how is the bus are affected by that. Mm -hmm. So either way, one way would be good. The uh, parking lot that's being paved in the fall on the corner of the Truck Route and Bridge Street, uh, the bus stop for that kind of grant will be transferred that project. The bus stop's moving there, so the bus stop will be eliminated at that intersection. Where's okay. it going to go again? On the inside stop. corner. Yes, the truck, the existing kind of wooden glass structure for the right. bus stop right. is moving from there to the corner of Bridge Street and the truck route. It's a gravel lot right now. We paved, oh, okay. we paved this summer and do a formal parking ride. Okay. Right. Good to know. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Other questions? Come on up just a second, Tom. <coughs> I'm Dan McLaughlin. Um, I often in the past, uh, we've not had the road for a couple of years, but just in going down and stopping to turn down Huckins Street, people come flying up the hill from railroad, and uh, they don't even think about stopping. It's not an intersection there. And um, also, during events, uh, both at uh, River Rats and the VFW, uh, it becomes a sort of a four-way intersection that, before the house was gone, was blind, we anticipate probably something will go back where the house was, uh, but which would increase traffic there as well. So, I, I mean, uh, the only thing that I thought about, I thought about it a couple of years ago, um, and when they took the big concrete uh, pavilion out of the middle, uh, and when they proposed the building of uh, the new uh, high-rise uh, housing there, um, it, it might be better to eliminate Huffington Street and put a bit of a retainer from the back of the, uh, I'm going to say approximately the back of the furniture store over to the new building at a taper and taper the parking lot back up to wherever we get a nice taper. I realize you don't want a rail hill, but um, in that way, um, the, the new building would front on the parking lot 
as well as the house on the corner would front on the parking lot. Um, and um, again, we've all lived without it. We know we can live without it. Uh, it would it would reroute stuff down on a railroad street, uh, but I don't. I mean, I don't know what else to do. I think it would give us a lot more parking and better access egress, both to the location the furniture store is, uh, the new high rise for lack of a better term, uh, and the other corner, um, and they would be fronting the parking lot. And I think the parking lot has never been it's been considered the backyard and. Um, so if there was a small retainer, pretty much across Huckham Street at a location convenient, with some kind of a walkway, um, especially at a handicapped access, um, it would give you the same parking uh, between the uh, realtor there building the building. Barber Real Estate. Yeah, and, um, and the furniture store. But then up at the top, it would give you a better layout plan for the entire parking lot. Um, and, and, um, and it would eliminate what would be an intersection between the VFW exit and the top Hopkins Street. And the, it's pretty much the hill that makes that intersection blind. When you're driving up it, um, and especially later in the day, you got the sun in your eyes. Uh, but if, uh, you can't always, I've seen so many times, uh, including somebody coming from the, they, they turn to go down Hopkins Street, and the guy coming up the hill, doesn't know that turn it and doesn't know he's, I mean, unless we, again, like you, uh, Todd would say, re engineer it, there should be a stop sign there so anybody coming up the hill. But that's a lousy hill to stop on, you know, for the, for the cross traffic. So that's, well, I, I think there's a complication there, but I, I think for parking, you would eliminate all the area that that current grass banking takes up would become part of the parking lot. A good amount of the fill in the parking lot could help fill that and bring it around. And uh, even looking at the elevation of the new building, I think that uh, could be something done there that would still allow for drop-off access. They might have to redesign it a little bit, but it's a sidewalk situation anyway. Uh, so. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I do hate to eliminate the street, but it's, like I said, I think it's going to bring a lot more parking and probably eliminate two fairly hazardous intersections. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, one, one thing with that, it, it makes me think we could try this, just make it one way, whichever way we do, and um, and in the future, if we don't like the way that is, we could... Yeah, you're going to still do the same Thank you. Tom, you have a question? No comment? Uh, Tom, we're still uh, trying to figure out how to make this work. Two questions. Will it be a sidewalk? running along there because we have parking we need people to walk on a sidewalk is that is that going to be done there's a sidewalk from the new building yeah up to the top of pleasant street on will that come, side will it come down there's there's nothing coming past the uh, barber slash monthly office right yeah. now because it's their parking area yeah that's one of my concerns and the second concern is at, at some point that building will be redeveloped and, and barber slash only building and that's when the sidewalk would get, come all the way down north of the street okay. the uh the spots that are going to be created by this uh one way. Are they going to go to the Hutchins uh, project, or are those going to be for everybody? I mean, that's it's, it's going to be a, a question. Free for all, I think. I would, I would, yeah. I would hope yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. First, first come, first serve. Yeah. yeah, it's on street right. parking like everywhere else. It's just free for all. It doesn't matter what they were out to get it for. Nope. But okay. No bait, there's no bait to switch going on. Okay. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> next time. Thank you, Tom. All right. Any comments? What do you think, Brian? Sounds good. I think down the hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yes. when you pitch out of the top, you can see better. Mm -hmm. And another thing, if you're coming up that hill and trying to stop there sometimes to get going, mm -hmm. I just think if we're going to do anything, do it one way, but it'd be down there. Mm -hmm. But my thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jess? Um, I agree. I think, I think it's a good idea to um, eliminate two-way traffic, make it one way, and uh, add seven parking spaces on Hutchins Street. Great. I agree. You go. You need Todd. Tom? Certainly, yeah. One way. Walk your too. Yeah, uh, Kathy, you had another question or comment. I did. Um, did um, Todd um, include a stop signs or any stop signs up there by River Arts when you're doing this one way, whatever way? Uh, stop sign where, Kathy? Sorry. 
<clears throat> well, at, the, at the top of Hutchins Street and going down over the hill down to um, 1099. I mean, you can't have can't have both ways um, going all the time. One way is going to have to have a stop sign. There aren't any plans in the parking bay for additional stop signs. The parking bay did discuss <coughs> making the steep section of Pleasant Street one way as well, but we dropped that from the report because that was more about traffic safety and that wasn't the committee's charge. The committee's charge was to create more parking and create it efficiently and cheaply, and that's why Hutchins Street just stayed in their port. They do agree that maybe it would be better to have this, this, the entire Pleasant Street be one way as well, but that wasn't kept in the report because, again, the report was about creating parking. It wasn't about a public safety issue, and that's really up to the road commissioner yourself. <coughs> How about, How about you, Do you have any comment? No. No. Well, yeah. go ahead, yeah. Kathy. You have something else? Yeah, I'm going to make this comment because Todd just said, we're trying to create something cheaply. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when we get up at the end of Congress Street, when you change the stop sign there, you have that house at the end of Congress Street that has those cars parked there all the time. And you can't see to the right way. You know, we're growing so fast. It can't always be the fastest and the cheapest way. You really need to really reevaluate that um, connection up at the top of um, the hill. But you guys will do what you want to do. So thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Um, can I just make a comment? Um, we have a really long agenda. And mm -hmm. um, the parking committee did. I was on the parking committee. We met a lot over the summer and we had we brought in um jason we brought in kevin we brought in eric um and it was public i mean you talked about we all talked all yeah ad infinitum so i know what that's like yeah so. okay yeah i'm just <laughs> i'm a little concerned about our time our timeliness for the meeting thank you yeah thank you <laughs> well each one of these agenda items can last an hour i know if, if, yeah. if the public wants them to i know yeah <clears throat> So you have a consensus from us? I think that's time? good. I think that's yep. good to move forward. Yes. Okay. Eric, you're happy with that? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. I want to ask one last question. Yes. Yeah. Not about the parking, but um, is it so? You'll be coming to us with these recommendations and 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 saying it's time now to make a decision. That's the, the ordinance. Yeah. The one from Miss Judy has a bunch of edits to do for new new roads or roads that have changed over the years and modernizing some of the language. The parking committee also has edited the existing motor vehicle ordinance language to reflect these changes. And so the culmination of the parking committee's work and then Judy's work will be in front of the select board in March or April as soon as Judy's as soon as Judy's ready for it. Okay. Judy's uh, first priority's budget and time. I, I'd like to add just a little bit to that. To slow things down just a little bit, the, the motor vehicle ordinance itself has not been looked at for years. I have sent the ordinance to Jason and his team to take a look at it as far as the roads and the posted speeds that are listed, the roads that are posted on those speeds. So if we're gonna do a, a, a look at this, I think the things that Todd is bringing to light, the one-way street piece, parking, if you're eventually gonna to work toward a parking enforcement piece, that needs to go into your ordinance as well. Those can be implemented sooner than later, but I don't think that we're gonna bring an entire rework ordinance to you, including speeds, all at the same time. I want to, I want to focus on what Todd's bringing in front of you now, because mm -hmm. we can work on that and implement that sooner than later. Um, and, and then Jason and his team will have time to do a thorough look at the roads and the, the posted speeds and make sure we've got everything in line. I guess my, my concern is that um, uh, I'm not sitting at home trying to figure out our time frame. That there's either Todd or you, somebody is doing it and saying to us, okay, now it's time for you to work on this part of the town plan or the, the parking. Um, information as you can see on the implementation plan i've got it all done and you're going to and you're going to tell us there and i, I hold your to it. okay good that's, that's, the plan. that's all i want to know yeah but i don't have a firm date for i have i penciled in the very bottom page 13 uh march 20th that may not be realistic maybe more april 20th or whatever the second meeting okay. was but somewhere this spring yes this will be in front of you as an ordinance for the park committee changes and some of the full routine changes that judy's going to do and jason can always come back and speed limits as a heavier lift later okay great thank you thank you thanks on the next agenda item so yeah stay, stay right there, there. <laughs> number five discuss brigham street parking lot as two-hour parking again as just said the parking committee met uh, a lot during the summer 
And one of the things it's trying to do, and some of the changes you made before in the sheet on page 13 of your package is we're trying to manage our parking for the first time. We really manage our parking. We have parking lots that strike and they're there, and that's pretty much what we do when we clear them, and we do a good job with that. We don't actually manage the parking. So the tightest parking lot we have, municipal parking lot in town, is Brigham Street. If you come back here, especially when the second chance is open or the business over at the, the Freemasons Lodge is open, it's busy back there. There are often cars parked outside spaces. So we'd like to bring a little regulation to it and a little more turnover there. So one of the issues that the parking committee found there is that most of those spots, and again, we're talking about the middle of the parking lot. So Brigham Street is right on the side of the building. It comes this way and actually turns into the parking lot. So the town controls the middle parking spaces. We really don't control the outside spaces. Those are private property. So we control the middle only. So this reports about changing those middle spaces to two hour parking from unregulated all day parking. What we're trying, what the parking is trying to do is those businesses back there, uh, urologist's office, the dentist's office, uh, the, uh, the clinic over here, all those businesses have customers that come throughout the day. And if we have all those parking spaces in the middle being kept up by people who work at any downtown business, but the town offices, Union Bank, you name it, the businesses around here, those parking spaces aren't available and people park where they're not supposed to or park far away or they don't patronize the businesses. So the, the intent is here as part of this whole package to assign those spaces as two hour only in the middle and we're assigning more all day parking in the municipal parking lot. Right now the whole side of the white building on the mini parking lot is assigned to our parking people park there all day and that's probably the intended, that's probably the best course of action for that but there's a small parking lot and a few businesses there that have patients on every hour, half an hour, those spots should turn over and not be there for all day parking. So the recommendation is to make the middle row of parking spot two hour parking uh, also, uh, talking about working with some of the businesses, we should really put some hours on the uh, hours on the ground and, and create a flow of parking. If you're coming down Brigham Street and turning to that lot, you really should be going counterclockwise. You come and you towards the Brigham Dental, you wrap around the urolo urologist and you, and you drive back out. One of the problems they see is people coming in both ways and two cars coming to a head with this number of maneuver. Okay. We're not giving people any indication of which way to go. Uh, the third part of this is, um, if you look at the parking lot, Kevin, I looked at today, if we're, if we're coming down to the side of the building on Brigham Street, there's two spaces that cars are often parked in that aren't spaces. We'd like to add those two spaces to the middle and strike them in. They're ones closer to a second chance. There's still enough of a roadway there. Our parking spaces are kind of pushed more towards the law office and the dentist's office. We can add two more spaces with a uh, paintbrush and some paint. Is it, are the, the lots, the spaces in front of second chance or there in the, the middle section that you're talking at the middle about? Section, at the middle section, but there are two spaces that can add the middle section closer to second chance. So I'm talking the second chance and the middle spaces, not the Black and Gavoni dentist office. So if you can add two spaces there when you're two. And Kevin looked at that, he's okay with adding those spaces. How many spots are there in that middle section right now? A dozen? Is there that many? About ten? Mm -hmm. There's maybe five? Two and three? About there's yeah. Yeah. No, there's more, but yeah, Brigham, more. Brigham has a sign that reserves for. Yes, which is an official sign. Yeah. They're just trying to create parking for their customers to come throughout the day. Yes. Right. So there's about 10 sites. Somewhere around there, yes. Yeah. yeah, and there's probably around that circle, there's probably five businesses. Oh, more. Is there more? more? Yeah. The building that used to be the SU building has. Uh, massage and those like kinds of oh, right. activities. Yeah, there's there's a tenant here, there's the dentist's office, the law firm, the urologist's office, there's the massage okay, place, so. and there's a law housing partnership. Everyone's trying to park right there. And it's really not the appropriate place for all day to be to park open. We're talking about be. less than two spots per business, which doesn't is not unreasonable. And, and again, we're not limiting all day commuter parking because we're only controlling the middle slots, the parking spots behind the, uh, the Mason building here. It's still be unrestricted. It's on their property and they don't want to restrict them. So if someone wanted to work all day, park all day, they work at the dentist's office, they can park there. Just the middle row, we're saying it should be two hour parking only. What I wonder is, uh, is it going to upset the folks that have the businesses out there and should we contact them before we just do it? You Which know, businesses on the one on Brigham Street? All of them, all of them out there. You know, the uh, I've talked to everyone on Brigham Street. You have? Uh, throughout the parking committee process and I circled back to everyone last week. I spent all the chunk of Saturday morning emailing back and forth with Kelly Ebert from the dentist's office and talking about the plan. So That's everyone good. was notified, everyone had a chance to talk to me. Some did, some didn't. That's good. And this is a, this is a, the, our police department can handle this? Uh, our police will assign it to our parking. <laughs> no. The police, when, when, the, when the enforcement is or not, I'm not going to 
speak. The, the sign has a lot of power. Yes. <laughs> we're asking, we're generally where our signs, our police department's very busy, we're asking for voluntary compliance for most of the signs. I mean, if there's someone's out there and two are parking and it's the three snowstorms and their, and their car's not clear, it's pretty clear they're violent to our parking and then maybe Jason might get a phone call and might send someone over, but um, I'll let Jason speak to that. Yeah, I mean, it's really going to be voluntary compliance because there's no meters. We're not going to know if somebody's parked there for two hours or three hours, four hours. And on top of that, you know, we're, we got one person on part of the day, so it's going to be tough for us to do any enforcement, even when we do get meters, if we get meters. Right. Sort of like the compact car signs that have a, a crew cab truck parked in front of them. Exactly. It's upsetting. Yeah. So you, you just need, you need a motion from us? Just a second, Sue. We have a couple of questions. Ma'am, you want to come to the microphone, please, and introduce yourself? Judy, yes, this will be a motion. Just a motion. Hi, Mary Nichols, Brooklyn Heights. Uh, regarding that parking, I'm down there a lot, in that uh, Brigham lot, and um, I really don't know how the uh, dentist got those special spots. I've heard that they maybe got them from a previous administrator or something. I don't know. But a lot of times those spots are empty, and it, ha and it leads one to believe that it's only for the dentist's office, and you go in there and they're, op they're open. So I kind of think that maybe you have to relook at some of this for certain businesses and uh, think that through, because if people think it's for a certain business, if you're an honest person, you may say, oh, I, I shouldn't park there. He might have a, there might be a dental patient coming in, or there might be a somebody coming in. So I'm kind of uh, concerned about designating for businesses sp specific spots. Thanks. Thank Just to speak to that quickly, that Brigham Street returns to town right away. We can't legally designate. Everyone has a right to park there. So right. those, that, those signs weren't approved through my office. So, um, But they're really incorrect because it's a public right of way. We can't reserve a public writer for private interests. Right. Public parking. Thank you. Well, I'd be able to question on some of as well. Come on up. Put that one here. Yeah. Susan Sinnott, Global Bio Housing Partnership, and I'm really shy. <laughs> so it's hard for me to get up and speak, um, but I do want to say that working on the Bio Housing Partnership, we have three employees, two parking spaces in front of our building, and my coworker has to park kind of near the pole, because most of the spots are always taken in the center. Um, we have massage therapists that work in our building. They rent from us. Um, one of them, I know, works five days a week, and she um, you know, can't go out to her car to move her car every you know, two hours. Um, we have another new tenant that has come on with us that she, in turn, um, is starting to work more and probably a third tenant. So what do you say to tenants that are renting that they don't have a place to park more than two hours? One step further, um, some of the massages are more than two hours. So just making a point. Thank you. Thank you. That's what my concern was. We have a question up there. Yeah, add in Ruth Rogers. Um, yes, I volunteer at um, Second Chance. And on Mondays, there's probably four of us that are there for four hours plus. So I'm just wondering, where would you like us to park if you make it a two-hour parking lot? That's a good question. The parking spots on the outside would still be unrestricted. We're just restricting the middle parking spot. So you can still park all day behind uh, the Mason's building right there in that parking lot. Or obviously, I mean, the intention is for these parking spaces to customers, so they're up for their for the businesses. I mean, if, if uh, I walk to work, obviously, but if I'm looking to, if I'm working in a business, I would try to park my car further away to allow the customers to get to the spots so that might be parking. And the municipal lot across the way, you can park down the Oxbow, you can park on the street and certain streets. So there are other parking spaces available. They're a further walk, but the intent is to open up the close by spaces for the tenants, create turnover, because most of those cars in the middle spaces are being left there all day. So, yeah, and I think that's so, I think that's something um, is that um, we are a small town and everyone's used to just parking, like having a parking spot and just parking at the business that they're shopping at. And even like if they're doing a bunch of errands in town, like getting back in their car and then going to the next business and then getting out 
and shopping. I, I just think it's going to require a, a little bit of a change of um, of habit. Um, if you live in a bigger town or if you live in a city, you do not take for granted that there's going to be parking. You just like you find your parking and then you walk to do whatever you're doing. So, and a lot of like I mean all the like restaurants and other businesses I've worked at, you are definitely not allowed to park anywhere near the building. You have to park far away, and then the customers mountain, you know, if the customers get the nice spot. So, I mean, I, I hear what everyone's saying, and especially if, if people are um, less less mobile, like I can see um, there being more of an issue, but I, it is, it's gonna require a change of, um, a, pers a change of perspective and a change of habit. But the municipal lot is really not that far away from um, Brigham Street. Brigham, Brigham Street, yeah. So just to be clear, Todd, the, the, the spots around the perimeter behind us here, those would not be two-hour parking. We're just talking about what's yes, in the middle. We're just talking about the middle spots. So we're talking about those 10 or 12, the however many spots the property, there are. The behind the lodge or in front of the urologist or, or uh, across the street in front of LHP, those are private property. We're not regulated. We're just trying to regulate what's in our public right of way. Yeah. Which are just those 10 or 12 in the middle. Exactly. Yeah. Come back to Just one, one more point. <coughs> Thank you. Um, also, too, the massage therapist has just, because I've seen people walk in there elderly, and they have a hard time, they go to get a massage because they're struggling. So, just making a point, I don't know how many hours they go in for a massage, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sarah. Todd, you mentioned the. Um, parking lot that's now two hours in front of like the post office, what's the time frame to maybe making that longer term parking? I, I came to work late today, I struggled to find a parking mm -hmm. spot anywhere in town. Hmm. That would teach you for coming in late. The municipal parking lot is redone this summer as part of that whole redesign and repaving. Uh, the parking uh, areas be reassigned at that time. So. That's a more of an Eric question when it will happen. It's June, July, it's, 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 it's May. I don't really know that. But at that time, more long term commuter parking will be put over there where they're not directly in front of businesses in a small lot. So it, we're just, we're not taking any shells off the table here. So we're just moving the shells around. Okay. And I know we, I don't know if I haven't talked to you about this for a while, Eric, but I had had, we'd had a plan, a potential plan to add more parking. One of the spots was down. By Thompson's, uh, the lot that Peter Bourne owns. It's kind of a hole right now before you go down over A Street. Mm -hmm. And Peter owns the property, and he was he was um, offering it to us. We would have to fill it up with fill. And I think I think Dan was saying you could get six or eight spots there, and as well as reconfiguring around that little turnaround and mm -hmm. angle parking in front of the noise. I think Dan had come up with 12 or 15 spaces additionally you know, between those two spots. So that's a future thing. I know that's one thing he didn't get done before he, he retired, but that was, I was gonna bring that up at some point too, but. Well, that's on the second, next page of your package. Oh, nice. Uh, so you'll, you'll get that sometime this summer. We'll be talking about that. Yeah, Spots good. Spots the Noise House Museum and Peter Bourne's vacant lot right there. Good, good. So. Bob, you have a hand up. Josh. I see that. Okay. Josh, Josh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll be really brief. I just, I pulled up Google Earth um, just for clarification, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's a dozen spots existing in the center right now, which will turn to 14 if we add the two. And then behind the Masons building, actually the length of Brigham Street and behind the Masons building existing right now is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 spaces. And Betsy Perez, the urologist, has two spaces along the front of her building as well as private parking for herself along each side of the building so you know the focus here was to get people able to walk to our businesses in town and um i i hear all the input from from suzanne and and others um even the second chance people but we we want people to park at second chance to go to second chance and to just this point the the municipal lots not very far and my last point that you brought up, Bob, is you know th this this whole recommendation is uh, is is multi pronged. You know we're we're dealing with two issues tonight, but but the whole recommendation put together was um, 
meant to be a collaboration of of any or all of the recommendations. So having additional sites at Noise House and in the other places in the in the report are you know, supplemental and, and meant to work together. It's a work in progress. Thanks, Josh. All right. Is there any anything else with this? Like to make a motion. Yeah, motion. Make a motion. We turn the Brigham Street parking lot, the the uh, center area, of the Brigham Street parking lot, into two-hour parking. Second. Does that work? That works. Um, I'm assuming we're including the two extra spots, and we're going to create a circulation around it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That was implied. Okay. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> I have a motion by Judy and a second by Don. Is there any further discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. Number six, Planning Council's short term housing letter. Different hat on this time. You're busy tonight. Okay. Okay. Planning Director. So the, uh, when the Select one of the trustees approved the fall zoning change this year. One of the directors from this board was to study the uh, allowance of potentially a second short-term rental for a property owner as a way to loosen the rules because the rules are newer and they're stricter. So the uh, council worked, wrestled this question and uh, authored the letter on pages 18 and 19 of your package. The letter is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they're willing to uh, look to ways to do it. It's a purpose-built short-term rental. But the council is most concerned about moving existing housing to more short-term rentals. We don't have the housing inventory to keep losing the short-term rentals. Every single family home we lose to a short-term rental conversion takes about two to three apartments to replace. And if you don't like the new apartments, then you should really be on the side of not wanting the short-term housing conversions that are happening. And again, our short-term rentals are growing at 7% per quarter. And the new rule stops that, but this was a, a discussion from Don in the mm -hmm. select board mm -hmm. about how to create more wiggle room in the final one and the add one the plus one what the letter really shows is everyone really has two right now so every property in this town uh, like myself uh, i have a house i have an accessory part of my garage i can also have a tiny house we have a tiny house bonus so every property owner can have three dwelling units and two of them could be short-term rented at any time what the new bylaw simply did is i just can't go by my neighbor's house or house across town to an, to an enlarge my short-term rental empire as a business purpose. So I'm limited to short-term rentals on my own owner-occupied property. Uh, what this says is they're not in favor of allowing the plus one that Don wants, or the select board wants, sorry, Don. Uh, okay. Elsewhere across town, it's hard to manage, it's expensive to manage, and it's really, it requires a, uh, it requires a different framework, uh, such as a, um, uh, it's in here, as a, uh, a rental registry. But however, if you do want to allow, if you think everyone needs three short-term rentals instead of two, we could craft a bylaw revision to allow a purpose-built short-term rental, a special permit. Here's your permit, you can go build a short-term rental. Short-term rentals aren't bad. Um, they bring people to town, they bring money to the town. Uh, they bring tourists here, you have a nice place to stay, a unique, you can experience more as well as a local, as a, like, a, like, a, like a local when you visit. Uh, however, they don't want to offer that up in exchange for the conversion of our housing stock. So they allow, they're okay with long purpose-built short-term rentals, they're okay with studying this more, they just don't want to do the off-site conversion of existing homes. That's where the board, the council stands. at the here, you can jump in. Okay. Uh, and any other questions you have. And we're having a, as a broadcast message, Julie Marks, who's the executive director of the Vermont Short-Term Renters Alliance, is coming to the planning council on Tuesday the 14th to discuss this in more detail. And we'll probably take a few pot shots on new regulations, that's okay, it'll be a healthy dialogue. And you're welcome to attend that as well too, of course. What, what time so, is that? Six o'clock, uh, five o'clock. Five, five o'clock on Tuesday the 14th. So what the planning council is recommending is that um, we um, we go we reconsider what we had decided on at the at the big meeting um, where we discussed the zoning law changes. Is that correct? And yeah. that we, plus we, one we with the re, yeah we reword it to say if it if it if you do have the plus one off site that it's a purpose built built structure it can't be like you don't you can't just like buy buy a camp and renovate it and, and that could be your correct only correction okay. i would say is they want it on site so they really oh. feel strongly that any short-term rentals should be on site because okay. if i have short-term rentals in my house if someone's being drunk or shooting up my guests or shooting up bars at two in the yeah. morning my neighbors know how to reach me mm -hmm. and they will let me know about it right. so the intent is to if the owner if the short-term rentals on the owner's property 
the owner has to suffer with any bad behavior just like the neighbors do, it makes them more accountable. So the planning council is okay with an additional short-term rental or purpose-built one, so allowing a third per property as long as it's uh, owner-occupied property. It has to be all on the same thing. Yeah. piece of land. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The thought process is yeah. once the, the fourth, short, the third short-term rentals across town, <coughs> your neighbors don't know you're not as accountable, you don't have to deal with your short-term renters just like your neighbors do. It makes everyone uh, put in a pot together. And the other contingency is that it it can't be something that is already existing. You have to build something. Correct. The council is really concerned about conversion of existing homes. I mean, with all the new construction you're seeing in yeah. town, our population increased by 200 people and change over the last decade, the last census, which is not a, that's a slow rate of growth. It's half the national average. So you have 200 toes on population. One is short-term rental conversions because you're taking houses away from people who want to live here. And they're here on weekends and, and here during the high season, but they're not here during the shoulder seasons. And the others uh, are shrinking household size. Household sizes are getting smaller in the U.S., Vermont in particular, is for grayer. By 2030, the average, I'm oh, sorry, the majority typical household size by the year 2030 is a single person household. So the, think of the Victorian on Congress Street, you used to have seven kids in it, nine family household back in the day. Those days are gone. That house now has three people in it, so it takes a lot more housing and it's just to maintain our 5,400 person population especially with the conversion. So they're really concerned with the housing crisis and affordability, not losing more houses off the market right now to short-term rentals. Short-term rentals aren't bad though, but we can allow them as purpose-built short-term rentals for new construction, which obviously grows a ground list as well. So Todd, you're correct. I mean, it, I, I will take ownership for that one plus one okay. suggestion, and that was the night yeah. that I think we passed the, the new bylaws. Um, I think it's pretty clear I threw that out there as a compromise to those individuals in town that were pretty outspoken at the planning council meeting at, up at the golf course, that last one, and uh, expressed their concerns about owning additional properties in town, or owning in particular one additional property in town and not being able to short-term rental it. Um, I think the, the letter that we read from Etienne from the Planning Council it does make a lot of sense. It's, it's very logical, um, but I did want to throw that out there. It's just something to discuss for the town to discuss. You know what? Because we've gone in the town from not regulating short-term rentals at all mm -hmm. to saying you can only short-term rental your owner-occupied property. Correct. And uh, so it was thrown out there as a compromise. Maybe it's you know again what the Planning Council is writing there does make sense. It's it's convincing. But, it, but I guess if nothing else, it's garnered a, converse, a conversation, right. and that's a good thing. And with the plus one, I mean, one of the things that, if you were to adopt a plus one offsite, so they want everything on site. The council basically said, if you're going to allow offsite, there's no way to track it with the rental registry. And the rental registry typically, uh, the annual fee is a one night's rental, pretty much. That's typical for Mont Town. So if we take our 200 plus or minus short term rentals with a $250 or $200 a night fee, you're making revenue to the town, adding revenue more than $50,000 a year. That's more than enough to pay for the person to monitor that. So often there are a lot of software firms, uh, other firms that, consulting firms that will do this for you and will offer a, a, a cornucopia of different options. You can just do the rental registry, some do the reg registry and the enforcement letters and all, all the different things that come with it. So it is a revenue source for the town. If you do want to go the plus one off site, which council doesn't like because it there's no eyes on the property that way, and right. people are less accountable. Uh, there is a revenue for the town, revenue source there as well for the rental registry. Because really, you need if you go to plus one elsewhere, you need to you need to track it somehow. <coughs> the registry is to do that. The registry also generates revenue. Yeah. So, are you looking for us to take some action tonight? Uh, no, you uh, you asked the council to study this issue, the plus one, and this is their response letter. So, if you want the council to do something further, or if you want to come to the meeting on Tuesday. Please feel free. I mean, I think Etienne would probably want to jump in. I hate to speak for my board the whole time, but I'll let him jump in if that's okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's his letter. Yeah, Tommy's <coughs> had a question for a long time. Then Josh, Tommy. Yes, this is Nancy. Actually, um, I would like to see it stay as owner occupied. Um, we have moved from a community that was high in short term rentals. It takes away from. People looking for to be able to live in the towns, your teachers, your nurses, there's just a lot less market available for people who live here and the problems that come with it. I would suggest that the town consider putting a cap, a number 
of if it does not want to do owner occupied, because there is no way that other people who live next to a short term rental should have to deal with whatever might be going on at that property. If you want to don't want to do that, I would recommend please to put a cap. Uh, this is going to get worse as the years go on and our close uh, proximity to stow. It's going to be a continuing problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nancy, just to clarify, what do you mean by a cap? Like a cap of the number of people allowed at a... Um, no, a cap, like, it, it, Jess, if there's a cap of, say, you allow 500 rentals, short-term rentals in town, that there, okay. is, that there is a cap on how many you allow to be in town. We don't want to live in a town that's all short-term rentals, I don't think. I think we want to live in a community where people live and work and play here. Um, we don't want to be um, a bedroom community for Stowe for people who don't want to pay Stowe prices. Um, this is going to continue to be a problem. We we have seen it happen in numerous communities, um, particular mountain communities. And I just think it would be wise before the horse is out of the stall to have some kind of plan to cap it. Thank you. Thank you. Josh. Uh, honestly, I would echo just a lot of what Nancy said. I just, I don't, I don't know. What? Oops. That's my fault. You got muted, Josh. Wait, wait, hold on. Okay, Josh, go again. I'll start right over. I, 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 I'm just echoing Nancy's sentiment quite a bit that, you know, we've really just started this discussion. I think the, the ask and what we responded to was a pretty specific, um, you know, alternative and, and we responded to it. Um, I would encourage the select board and anyone to come to our next planning council meeting to hear one side of the voice. I'm not here to endorse anything Nancy said or anything anyone else has said, but there's there are a lot of loud voices on both sides. And I think Nancy's point that this isn't going anywhere. Um, I don't, you know, the short term rentals are are dying a death of a thousand cuts in some of the bigger cities and states across America, but we're going to lag a little bit behind. We're kind of in our own little corner here and we're very close to a very popular resort town, if not another and another, you know, as well as the rail trail. So it, it's not going to go anywhere. And I think the discussion is, is just beginning to um, morph and develop. And I think it's going to take a lot more than, than one meeting or two. So Purely encouragement to the public and the select board to, to stay tuned and get involved. Thanks, Josh. Come on up here, Tony. And then you, Lee. Everybody's scared of this microphone, huh? There you go. <laughs> um, your voice isn't loud enough. You gotta yeah, speak. You know. <laughs> well, I live on Cody Hills and I got two short time rentals. The reason why I got two short time rentals is because I don't think our legislator and is doing their job. When you have to go to court to get people out because they don't pay you or something else, because I don't, I guess it's a, it's an offense where you can't get people out for eight, ten months. Mm -hmm. People, people are going to keep renting short time and Airbnb, and that's just the way I feel. And you're going to get more and more Airbnb because at least you're making money. Now, if you're making $1,500 a month on an apartment and somebody ain't gonna pay you because they don't wanna pay you, that's a no-brainer, right? So I think our legislator needs to step in there and change the rules. Thanks, Tony. So anybody that has legislation uh, ends, talk to them. Talk to them. I don't know how that goes. Slide, <laughs> slides in from the top. There you go. Good job. Lee, come on up here. You got to come to the microphone, Lee. Just so the folks out in Zoom can hear you, because it's too muffled if you don't. I just wanted you to explain what the one plus one means. The idea was that you, you have your one lot that's owner-occupied, like my house. Yeah. And you could have one more. And then you can own another lot somewhere awesome. in town that's not right. part of that lot. 
Okay. Are that you, you sure? would short term. Yeah, yeah, that's that was I, what I was thinking. It had to be on your property. No, no, that no. was the proposal. See, that was the one. Was the, that, that was the one plus one, one idea right. that was thrown out to the planning council. You're, right. You're talking about the one that you had said. That's yes. what you're. Yeah. So the one that's enacted right now is you own a piece of property and you could rent out um, your house yourself. You could short term rent it. You could put a tiny <clears> house on it. If you have a carriage house or whatever on your property, you can rent those out. Because that's a, what's happening now. If you own a separate property, not your property, where you live. You cannot right. currently you, short term rental it. If you're, you're grandfathered in, if you already were doing it. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> but you can't, if you own a second property in town, you can't short term rent in that property. Your rentals have to be 30 days or longer. Yeah. But, but, but if they have a short term rental, they can be so grandfathered, yes. They're grandfathered in. Unless the town. Is, Adopts an ordinance at some point. Zoning is always forward looking, not backward looking. So, mm -hmm. Mike, sorry. So, yes, anyone that was operating a short term rental before, it was October 6th, the zoning change was advertised, they would be grandfathered because zoning always is forward looking, doesn't look backwards. Many towns regulate short term rentals, if you, especially if you had a registry, if you had an ordinance. And that ordinances are not uh, forward looking only. So, they would not be grandfathered if we do an ordinance. But right now we have zoning not to cloud the situation, so yes, the grandfather, because under a current regulatory scheme, if you guys went to a reg rental registry, you'd likely do an ordinance instead of zoning, and then there'd be no grandfather. Okay, does yeah. that make sense, Lee? It does and it doesn't. If, if you are going to allow, if you're going to allow uh, an extra short term, what does it matter if it's on your property where you live or on another property that you own? Right. It doesn't make sense to me. Right. You're well, if you're taking up, um, you're using the, somebody who wants to move in here and rent can't then because it's only a short, short term. Do you have a different explanation? I think the bigger answer is accountability to the neighbor. So okay. they want the planning council wants all the rentals to be on site. So if your guests are being are behaving poorly, you have to live within your neighbors, have to live with your neighbors. You live there and they know how to reach out to you. But if I go buy a property on Goodell Avenue or somewhere where the neighbors don't know me and my tenants are coming every weekend and partying, they don't I don't have to deal with it. I don't have to, I'm not as accountable to the neighbors, they may not know me as well. So the intent is to put everyone in the pot together and make you live with the tenants that you have short term, just like you're making your neighbors do. So it's about accountability. And it's about access to the owner versus having no guests <coughs> outside of the lines. That's the theory. I guess. Yeah. And I <coughs> I was in favor of what Don was proposing because like I, I just bought a house in another town and I'm gonna do short term rentals. And it could have easily just been a, been a house here. I've owned many houses here before that I wanted to have short term, and I couldn't do it. So you're doing short term because you make more money. I I, okay. I do all, all. traveling nurses, you know. Thank you. Um, we've got three questions up there. Etienne, go ahead. Well, I just wanted uh, Todd and, and Josh summarize the planning council um, side of this very well. I just wanted to add that there there may be. There may be some mixture of, of options that we could implement, and that's one of the reasons for um, uh, Julie Marks to to come and, and brief the council next week. Uh, something like they they propose something like uh, you can you can resurrect blighted properties, you could do new construction, you could do an overall cap of the number in town. Those are all different options that could exist to enable us to do what Don was originally proposing in addition to the rental registry. So I think it's it's pretty key that this is gonna be a package of potential options that we'll come around to uh, probably a little bit later in the year with further discussion. Um, anyway, just wanted to summarize that. That's a nice choice of words at the end. I like that. Um, Nancy, you had another comment. Yes. If you're um, planning to um, rent properties or availability in your own home, I feel like that's one thing. When you have a property across town, you don't know what they're doing. If you put a cap on it 
and and there's continuing problems with a property that you rented out to people who party all night long that when it comes time to renew the next year, they don't have renewal. If they have, you can decide how many strikes they have out. If they continue to rent to people who are not um, cognizant of other people that live in the area, I think the capping it and and doing a yearly register, and if you don't take care of your situation, that there is a way that the town can mitigate that because it all comes down to us paying more for police or anything else, and that's a drain. And I would say to people who own multiple properties and don't want to do long-term rentals, I would highly suggest since we're in a housing shortage that you would consider selling your house so someone who does live in the community could actually have a home to live here. Thanks, Nancy. Now, the Z, who's the Z up there? Zeph, Zeph, Brian. Zeph, go ahead. You're muted. Hi, how's it going? Good. We've been renting our house since 2009. We were an early adopter of VRBO, and we've had zero problems with neighbors or renters. I hear these comments. It just assumes that all renters are bad and they're just going to party and rage. And that's just not true. Um, so, and then we have a piece of land that we've been planning on building on, um, place to go. And, you know, it's like you're forcing people to live, you know, only be able to rent the house that they live in. That assumes that they have somewhere to go, unless it's a, you know, a house with a, an apartment or a, a tiny house or whatever. So that's just, it's, not realistic so you know if you if you live in your house and you don't have a place to go then you're basically you you can't enjoy the income from a rental property which i just don't think is fair um and then you know a lot of these comments make it sound like you know these village is where the real concern is and i wasn't at a lot of these other meetings did did having a one percent tax on these uh occur at any that ever come up with anybody because I can assure you that the customers or the renters, when they're paying one more percent on VRBO or Airbnb, it's not going to make a bit of difference to them. And that would generate a really, probably a nice piece of work. Thank you. Um, and I've asked Todd about this because I've missed these meetings um, that the Zoom, is the planning commissions aren't Zoomed? Because it would be really, you know, it's helpful to have the Zoom form, I think. The budget passes, you may get that. That's right. We'll, we'll see that. That position there, is in the There you go, 1%. percent help, you know, everybody's complaining about the budget. Yes, the 1% that Zeph is alluding to is our is 1% local option rooms and meals tax. Uh, so that, if you Airbnb in town, if you VRBO or you rent from the Sunset, you'd be paying an additional 1% that would go to the town. Uh, the bigger driver of that really is the meals tax. So for those of us who are lucky enough to afford to go out to eat a couple times a week with myself, uh, I'm going to be paying the 1% of the meals tax if you adopt it. Uh, the key driver of that is we're actually one of the higher producing meals and rooms towns in the state because we have two large grocery stores and they sell prepared foods. Every time you buy rotisserie chicken or sushi or something they prepare there, you're, you're that, that space that counts towards the rooms and meals tax. So Roughly, we're leaving about 150,000 to 125,000 on the table every year by not adopting the rooms and meals tax. There's pros and cons to that, obviously, but that revenue obviously could be used as well. For me personally, uh, I know when the planning council proposed this five years ago, I had Alan Van Anen on one side of me saying, I have 60,000 unique visitors to Lost Nation a year, and they are driving from New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, 1% on a 9% tax bill on their bill, we could care less about. Not, a, not, even, a, not even a thing. And Steve Benson on the other side of the room is saying, you're going to hurt my business on 1% of rooms and meals tax, which I get too. But on an average dinner bill for two people, $80, I'm talking 80 cents. And it's not, a, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a prohibitive burden for you going out to eat. And the beauty of the rooms and meals tax is most of the people who are paying it either don't live here or the people who are choosing to go out to eat, you don't, you don't have to pay the tax. You're choosing to go out to eat and you're saying I can afford that 80% of my dinner bill, 80 cents of a dinner bill. It's not 80%. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Yeah, you still have your hand up. You can, you can take it down. I don't know how to take it off, but. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. 
So we, you don't need any action on this at all. No, this this is a, this is a uh, sorry. The is the select board asked for a response. This is the planning council's response. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, the council may do this, may study this more. They could hear from Julie on Tuesday, and they can decide to drop this. I mean, the planning council has been doing the short term thing for five years now. They're a little weary of it, so. If there's a good change, a reason to make the change, I think they will. But um, it's an ongoing conversation. They're going to talk about it on Tuesday with the Short-Term Rental Alliance Executive Director. And we'll see where it goes from there. So please attend if you're really interested. Please don't uh, uh, do it so we can attend, is it? What's that? Right. <laughs> I hope you're serving chocolate that night. I'll try. Go ahead. Uh, Harper Phillips, uh, I live in Stoke. And I was not here for this tonight, but since you're talking about it, I really think what that it boils down to is being a former landlord, a person who made his living doing this, is this a zoning issue. You're introducing, when you get down to short-term rentals, you're introducing a hotel environment to a residential neighborhood. So somewhere in there, there's a time frame where a rental goes from short-term hotel, motel style to a resident of a community, and residents have more accountability for their neighbors. So I've been on both sides. I've had to pay to get tenants out, I've had to deal with neighbors, but you got to thread that needle somewhere in the middle where it's you're not introducing hotel motels to residents. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for your comment. I'm sorry, can you just repeat your name again, please? Harper, Harper, Harper Phillips. Harper. Harper. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> All right, so where are we at now? Do you need anything more from us? No, this is your response to your agenda. And it's, it's, if you can direct the council to study this more, you can direct the council to do the purpose for short-term rentals. You can come to me on Tuesday, or it's up to the board. Be nice to hear what's said on Tuesday for sure. Yeah. Ball is in your court. <laughs> That's next Tuesday, correct? This coming Tuesday, yes. No, this next Tuesday, the fourth. Next Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Valentine's Day. Have you by six thirty? Valentine's Day. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. I'm holding you to that. Okay. So are you looking for us to, to give you some kind of recommendation or not? If you want to. I'm not looking for anything. You ask for a response. This is the board. This is okay. the council's response. This could be the end of the discussion if you so right. choose. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it brings up a lot of um, good questions. And um, the my only concern is um, that we would be creating a situation for people who may already have plans to construct short-term rental properties. Um, but again, I I really don't want us to turn into a, um, a bedroom community more than we already are. So um, I, I stand by the decision that we made at our, um, at the zoning, um, the zoning meeting, um, the zoning laws meeting. Um, I think it's, I think it's good to, um, we, like it's, it is a regulation. It's the first regulation to see how it pans out. Um, I also am for um, a rental re registry. Um, if that's not onerous and if we can um, afford the staffing for that or if it's, a, like you said, a, um, a service that's offered. Um, so those are my, my, my three or so thoughts on that. All right. <clears throat> and I think, the, you know, this is a very important issue that can affect everybody in town and I think the words due process is a really good thing here we don't want to make a decision too quickly we want to hear more information from folks and like this uh, person that's coming next Tuesday it'd be nice to have more information and more data before we make any final decision on on something like that it's really important on both sides I've I'm kind of on both sides now and I'm uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure either way but it's, it's very important and it's Great to hear from all these taxpayers that that um, you know it's part part of what's going to shape our town in the future. So I also think about folks that are that are retired and, and part of their income stream will be having a, a short term rental. You know they might want to have a, a traveling nurse, a, like the gentleman up there was talking about. I've I've done it with, for years, we, and had great people. On the other side of that, I've had to give a car to somebody to get them out of the house before. You know, so I've had both ends of the spectrum. So <clears throat> one of those things, but I think more to follow. I think right now we're still gathering information, can learn more about it before we make any, any decision. But I certainly appreciate all the work that the zoning, the planning council is doing. 
<clears throat> if, if we don't make a decision quickly on something, it doesn't mean we don't appreciate all the work and time that's put in by the council members and everybody else that, that are putting input in. So I think we can, we can leave that one and, and um, wait for further information. Good. It does say in this letter that if we don't want to attend the short-term housing meeting on February 14th that they're requesting a, a written response to the letter. So mm -hmm. about whether we would like to continue the short-term housing regulation dialogue. So can we say that we want to continue the dialogue? Well, it's the wait till the meeting and maybe some of us will go to it. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. I'm, I'm planning on going. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try to do too if I make my wife angry going out on Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but, okay. We'll move to the next one, number seven. Updated site assessment for town owned Noise House Museum property. Why don't you pull up a chair? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> this is my last one, thankfully. And Bob, if you come to the planning, you can actually save some money without that. That's it. have to work that night. Right. Uh, <laughs> my wife was on that board for a long time. Probably that's probably true. Okay. Uh, the, uh, so I'm here with a different hat on. I'm the select board's rep to the uh, Historical Society Noise House Museum, as you may know. So the Noise House Museum Historical Society has uh, got a grant from uh, the uh, Vermont Housing Trust um, preservation for Jill Brack. The Jill budget's on the uh, the chair is on the line. Uh, the $500 grant helps fund the site assessment for the Noise House Museum. That starts on pages, I believe it's 22 of your past, 21 of your yeah, 20. 20. So at the end of that report, so the report's very good, and the, to summarize real quickly, the person who wrote the report used to actually spend some time and do a little work in the Noise House Museum, and he was very impressed with the talent building there. The building's in good shape. The barn is not in good shape, however. So if you look, to our the report, here's some pictures and recommendations. There are dollar figures attached to the report in terms of repairs. So if you total up the dollar figures, you're somewhere between $50,000 to about $85,000, $90,000 on the repairs needed in this report. So as you know, every year the town uh, town meeting has voted to elect the last four years, five years, two months, something like that a half penny of the grand list towards building repair. The town took ownership of the building about a decade ago, and the town has been seeing repairs made to the uh, Of these repairs, we've done a lot of things. We've supported the fireplaces that are about to fall to the floor and rip apart the sides of the building. We've, re we've uh, repointed the bricks. We've rewired the building, taking up the knob and tube, especially the barn. We've made great improvements with the building plants, uh, but there are improvements that need to be made. So this is just a sharing, this uh, site assessment of the board. And the cost to maintain the property to fix some of the issues. The half penny this year, unless we reallocate it based on the report, was being used to replace the cracked, failed plaster in the kitchen pantry and take some of the old 1960s historic and appropriate drywall out of the kitchen, put real plaster walls in the kitchen. Uh, there is a little extra money left over there, but not nearly enough to continue to fund $60,000 to $80,000 worth of repairs. So uh, we're hoping the half penny. Uh, survives the town meeting, uh, the town ballot vote for town meeting this year, because uh, the money is badly needed. And if the town residents do not want to fund that half penny, it's something the select board will have to make a decision on in terms of adding it to your budget next year instead. Because the, the barn itself has some problems with some water right now that if left unattended will get worse and become more costly. And a half penny right now is 37, 36, 37. Right around 34. 34. Thank you. 34,000. And Jill's on the uh, Jill's on the line. She's the chair. She did the walkthrough with the uh, store preservation expert, and so I think I'd love to have turn this over to her and sure. disappear for the night. From my <laughs> okay. uh, yes. Um, so the Jan Lewandowski's report. He's really the best in the business, and uh, people know who he is. And uh, it was really great to walk through the building with him. And as Todd said, he's really pleased with all the work that Donnie and his crew have done over the last decade or so. And the building on the whole is looking a lot better than it did in the late 70s, early 80s when Mr. Lewandowski uh, worked on the building. The most problematic items in that report, it's not necessarily the barn, although that is a problem. The, the questions about the elliptical fan light, which as you know, is the central architectural feature of the formal front door and characterizes the, the house. There's questions about whether the weight from the second story floor is crushing that. And you can see the 
estimate range is quite varied there, but that's a very problematic situation that Don, Donnie um, and I have talked about. And he's going to take a look at this spring. And then the second uh, big ticket item is uh, re repointing the windows, reglazing all of those windows so that they don't leak moisture into the house. And um, so as Todd said, uh, there are just with, with any old building, there's constant upkeep. And since the town owns the building, this is a brand new up-to-date assessment on uh, what needs to be done. And we certainly have accomplished a lot over the last 10 years, but in particular that elliptical fan light and the need to work on all of the windows, um, those are big problems. Jill, um, is there any, um thought in the future of putting storm windows on the windows uh i don't think so we don't at the moment have heat in the building so we don't really have a need for storms um and storms i i'm not sure would be historically accurate for the house uh mm -hmm. but the, the windows uh just need to be reglazed and worked on which is something that as i'm sure you know folks used to do all the time and now it's more of a dying art but my understanding is there are still craftsmen in the area who do that kind of work and it's just uh it's an expensive project though but we don't want water to start getting into the building i just have some experience with a, an old farmhouse in maine and it was suggested not only to reglaze the windows, but put storms <clears throat> on them, even though there's no heat in the house. Aha, uh -huh. so, interesting. I could I could ask Mr. Lewandowski what he would think about that. Yes, it, it would preserve the, the windows and they wouldn't be needed as much upkeep. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Jill, the, the fan light you're talking about, I see the, the cost range is a big range, mm -hmm. 3,000 to 22,000? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so Donnie, uh, I talked to Donnie this month about it. And what he would do is in the spring, get up there. He agrees with Mr. Lewandowski that he'd need to go in the hallway inside the museum and get into the ceiling there. I got him coming to the microphone here. Yes, I, I read a report all over and uh, took, took quite a bit of detail. We're gonna go out and look at the place some more, some, some of the items that I've never actually in the last Two years. Look through the place 100% of iron and all that. Yeah, I remember you. But after going through that, we're gonna we're gonna meet again. But I went through and his numbers, his rough numbers are, are there. But the biggest the biggest issue there, yeah, as you can see from the inside, mm -hmm. the sag. It looks like there's a big sag in the ceiling. So we actually have to take that whole plaster ceiling out yeah. in order to find out what's going on structurally. Yeah. And then obviously we got to put it back in. And when we put them back, they go back authentically. This is. Horse hair plaster. plaster. This is not blue board and yeah. So that's plaster. Would laugh the whole works when we put them all back. So and then once we get it open, you know what is it? Do we need to put a header across or the sag? Has there been a broken choice? You know. Right. Well, it's interesting because the, the outside pictures don't show. Yeah, any, it looks like you can see a little bit. Show it's bad, but over the yeah. years, it, uh, it looks like it's sag the there. Right. A little bit of. Uh, pointing going on. There's no lintel, no structural lintel, I mean steel lintels mm -hmm. or concrete lintels, all of those. And the wood structure itself, the art, mm -hmm. will tend to be a supporting piece on its own. But on the interior where you see that big sag, there could be the joist inside mm -hmm. pushing down because those bricks are independent of uh, the frame. Okay. So uh, okay. That's a that's a true True structure on the bottom side of it. Those are right. double layered, so structural, those bricks are structural. Yeah. And then when you get to your band for your second floor, they set in because it sets on top, and then traditionally you don't have as many layers of brick on the second floor up. Like there could be only two, I think it's four layers on the bottom section. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take more investigation to figure out what it is. But the plastering, the dropping that ceiling and plastering alone, because you can't. You can't make it look right. It's going to need a little work anyway. That was one of the other areas we looked at. Is you're going all the way back into the hall, back to the to the uh, round post staircase. Not mm -hmm. like you're going to take out a piece like this and put it back, and that's all it's to it. Yeah. You'll take most of that ceiling back. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember my my grandfather was a mason, and he worked on that building many times over the years. I remember in the '70s going there with him, and he, I remember working on this front. Her. And I'm like, Grant, when are you going to be done? He's like, forever and ever, never working on it. 
Yeah, that's cool. Well, we did all the chimneys uh, last year, year before. Chimneys have been all work. In the back there, too. Yeah. yeah. So it is. It's come on. Uh, the plaster work that was done in there last year is uh, made that whole entry, all cleared up. That's yeah. all done. We did the back part off in the, uh, the kitchen. The kitchen area and all that is in need right now. I mean, over the years, it's been bastardized a bit with drywall layering. And that's really bad in that area. I mean, if you had to take uh, priorities, and that's what we're going to look at again with Jill and Eric is going to be in on this, go down through and let's get a real scope of what has to be done right now. Right. Yeah. Like that window. Yeah, what's more of an aesthetic, aesthetic problem and what's more of a structural yeah. problem also. You want to stop moisture even in the barn area that they're talking about. The more moisture that's in there, the more trouble we're going to have. Mm -hmm. that alone, so. mm -hmm. And quite a bit was done with the basement, right? The basement had a lot of... Yes, over the years there's been quite a bit done in the basement. Uh, foundation structures for the chimneys have been all redone. That's all good. Yep. We don't get anywhere near as much water down as they used to have. They used to have. So good drainage around. Right, there was a moisture problem down there. There's a moisture problem. Yeah. That was years ago. Yeah. They were slightly heating it and not heating it. That's even worse than right. heating it at all. Mm. Well, all right. Do you Thanks, have Tony. any sense until you open this up as to how immediate some of this work is? Yeah, so... Well, that'd be my first one. Yeah. yeah I'll open up and find out there. Cause Defend. You, 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 you crush that pan, I mean, that's, that's, you know, it's extended glass. It's yeah. There's a lot going on in there. Mm -hmm. You want to do that first. And we're right now, put you, putting together a plan, I actually talked to a plaster today, as a matter of fact, uh, when we can get in there and hoping that we can get in and get the ceiling down prior what we've been trying to do is not interfere with the uh, schedule for you to be open. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not heated, so we go through some problems there to make it happen so it works out well. We have to dry the plaster for 30 days. And, mm -hmm. But it's been working. Yeah. We've been making it happen. Well, yeah. thanks for the report. Yeah. I just answered what he did. The guy did all the work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you know a lot about it too, though. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donnie. I'll just add that um, the the reason we sort of uh, honed in on it, the first question I asked was, why is the pane in the elliptical fan like cracked? We were standing, Jan Lewandowski and I were standing on the bottom step in the hall. And I said, look, this pane of glass is cracked. And he looked up and he said, oh, no. And that's where he said, see how it's the ceiling is like sitting on top of the fan light. And so it does seem to be a pressure problem. But um, and so it's great to have Donnie helping with that. So in right. terms of, are we prioritizing this or this is a, just a presentation to us to so we understand where the grand list money is going? I would so, say if the grand, oh, go ahead, Todd. Oh, you can go ahead and answer. I was just saying this is, a, as a select board's rep to the historical facade, this is a report. You are the owners of the building, uh, town meeting, or you will fund the building. Uh, if it's going to maintain and do repair, and this is the uh, these are the new estimates and the new costs to do so. So, right now uh, we have fifty thousand dollars accounted for, uh, but it's not enough to do all these repairs, especially some of the fan light and some of the barn work. I mean, there's a picture in there with some of the knife sticking out the side of the barn and the rotted wood. That only gets worse as time goes on. There's new clapboards needed on the barn, um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and there's money that it's going to cost. So hopefully the Voters will still be generous with a half penny to keep one of the longest, oldest houses in Morrisville standing in good condition, our museum in good condition. If not, it's something that's going to impact your budget next year. Has to. All right. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Thanks Jill. Jill. Thank you, Jill. All right. We'll move to number eight. Discuss date for special town meeting. Petition to move all budget items to Australian ballot. Sarah. <laughs> So we've received the petition that you all know about, about moving all, all budget items to Australian ballot that we can't act upon because we're going to be all Australian ballot. So um, I've been in a lot of communication with the school, um, trying to find a date that we can um, use the facilities. It's pretty um, tight. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be 10 days, right? 10 days well, before. no, uh, um, we, ha we have to do it within 100 days of receiving the petition, which is a um, by April 29th. It has to be. Um, we have to hold the, the meeting by then. Um, going back and forth, what they're proposing is 
Tuesday, April um, 18th at 6 o'clock and to use the auditorium. The gym during the spring is basically impossible to use because they have classes and just um, the time of setting it up. Um, and then they have all sports using it in the evenings um, because they can't be outside during that time. Um, there's no, um, it's not school break. School break's the week after, so um, family members and, and um, theory are in town. They won't, and, and teachers and stuff won't be um, away. And I've spoken with um, Shap Smith, the moderator, um, assuming he were to be reelected, um, and he is available that evening. Okay. Any comments from the board? And why <coughs> why not earlier? Just to throw that out there. Um, why not host it? Why? Early? Yeah. Why not? Why wait till April eighteenth? Um, just um, timing of school vacations. Okay. Um, I'm away at a conference. <laughs> um, Shap is away two weeks okay. um, on vacation. Um, it just yeah. seemed, and then there's different school and service days. I actually wanted to selfishly do it the week before because the village meetings that week, I thought, oh, great, people will have that. It, it wasn't available. Okay. Um, it, there, it's very, um, it, the, the school uses their facilities a lot, so they, there was not much that um, yeah. they could offer me as availability. Okay. The auditorium fits about two to 300 people. And it's all set up with chairs. It's all set up with all the um, microphones yeah. and all and all that. That so. makes sense. Yeah. Is it would the meeting be able to be? We wouldn't be zooming it anyhow because it's on. You couldn't zoom it. We're not allowed to because it's an election, and so therefore um, voters will have to check in just like at town meeting, get their piece of paper, um, verify that they're registered voters in order to vote and speak. Um, so you can't you can't zoom it. Um, I can talk to Peter and or GMTCA to see if they can record it um, and people could listen to it after, but um, we're not allowed to have Zoom part participation. You have to be there in order right. to go in and just speak. Right. Okay. All right. And I guess it's something later, but it's the... The next, the night before would be a regular select board meeting. So it's be a regular select board meeting and then this special meeting. That's up. You can talk about it later. That's up to us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Do you want a date? You want a yes or no tonight or no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The quicker you make a decision if you want to use a school facility would be the sooner that yeah. our chances of actually being able to use a school would be better. I'll make a motion that we set the special select board meeting to discuss special town meeting special town meeting on us yeah for tuesday april 18th at six o'clock at the pa auditorium second. auditorium or gymnasium auditorium. Auditorium. okay just want to make sure second. i have a motion and a second any further discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. any opposed the motion is passed really? unanimously <coughs> Old business. Discuss class four road policy. So what you have before you is a copy of the town of Stowe's class four road and legal trail policy, which you uh, directed me to, to bring to your attention. Uh, I sent it to you an email a little over a week ago. And in comparing it to the version that uh, Jim Barlow sent um, as a recommendation, this one reads more friendly more neighborly I mean I'm not sure how to put it but friendlier yeah, yeah. Uh, so you see this it's, Selena? it's my, my question tonight for the board is having reviewed this document do you feel more comfortable this is a starting place for the completion of your class four policy yes I certainly you did. do yes okay yeah does anyone else want to look at it I'm not sure copy I have can I ask one copy? I have an extra copy. Can I ask yeah. questions? I'm sorry? I wanted to ask a question about it. Oh, please. Did, yeah. did you have this one? Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't, some here. Yeah, I don't we can make some more. And I've got more outside. Mm -hmm. 
On the second page under logging activities, they have the word unreasonably, shall not be unreasonably. And that seems to be a, a difficult word to use. I mean, you can't quantify that. I don't know. Just, I just was throwing, I'm going to throw it out there. <laughs> you want to go down that rabbit hole? Oh, I, I don't want to, but I think it's going to make them back to bite Unreasonably us. withheld. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know who determines what's unreasonable. Exactly. Since you brought this up, Judy, <laughs> this paragraph caught my attention too. In Vermont, we there's been exemptions for logging activities and for ag activities in lots of different realms. And I'm just wondering if we did adopt a policy like this, if we could think about this being for agriculture as well. And just, you know, we're talking about this because of issues access, <coughs> excuse me, accessing agricultural fields. Um, I don't want that to go by the, the wayside. We have a number of class four roads in the town and uh, I know of some, I have one right near me that's used for agriculture on a regular basis. Um, I'd just like to, I'd, I'd like that to be part of the conversation. That maybe if we were to adopt this, that it wouldn't just be for logging if we did put an exemption in, but that there might be something for agriculture as well. Agricultural businesses in this town are really important. They're really important to, uh, really important to the, uh, the culture of this town, very important to people that visit this town. I know where I live, people are coming up all the time and spending time around the farm that, that I live beside. So I'd just like to consider that. Don, uh, if you look on the, the first page in uh, number three, yep. it does speak to agricultural and forest management on there. Is that what you're discussing or you <coughs> wanting to expand upon that? Yeah, that's what I'm kind of getting at, but I'm just like under number four, there's clearly something said here about logging activities, and I'm just wondering if we can't do something similar for agricultural activities. Saying like per per permission for the use of gated class four highways and legal trails to to access properties for logging and agricultural activities, something like that. Right. Shall not be unreasonable. Because under number three, it does talk about ag and forest management. And then under number four, ag uh, forestry is singled out. The tough thing is a policy, like any policy like this, is it's very hard to cover every scenario. There's so many different scenarios for for class four roads and class four roads have a broad impact on everybody, you know, and it's gonna be hard to have a policy that's gonna cover everything. But, you know, we certainly don't want the legal mumbo jumbo version of it, but we want something that's gonna cover most everything that we can think of. There's always gonna be something else, so that's gonna to be tough. Agreed, yeah. I had another question, maybe, maybe Kevin can answer it. It just said, um, uh, do we, do we do anything to put down established vehicle weight limits on class four roads or uh, we put signs up about anything on class four roads? So we don't now. I'm wondering if we adopted this, would we then have to be putting signs up on our class four roads? That's a question for Eric. We don't set any weight limits on class four roads because we don't do any maintenance on them. Right. Okay. So I just know if that number five would be uh, something that we would um, consider or not consider. I don't know. I think Bob made a, probably the most uh, valued statement in that trying to cover all scenarios is very, very difficult. I think the end result for the board and the liability within that is about the structure of the road being built. It's not so much about granting permission for someone to upgrade it for for whatever purpose. It could be to access their home, it could be for agricultural purposes, for logging. It's a determination of to what extent the road needs to be improved so that the left, what's left behind once the improvement is done is not a liability to the, to the taxpayers. 
right. such that you got to go back in now using other resources and pay for it out of taxpayer dollars to, to fix it. So it's the process. It's how you know how you want it built. Certainly, if you take a class four road and run uh, a, a farm tractor across it, it's not going to do nearly as much as a loaded bog truck. So it depends on what the use is going to be for to a certain extent. So it, it seems fitting that as with our current road policy, that if there is an improvement to a road, that it be built to a specification. There's a, we have a standard in our existing policy for building roads, um, private roads. So it's like there is a layering of the gravel and whatnot. But again, it can be, the, the, the policy can read the way you're more comfortable with that depending on the use of the road, maybe it doesn't need to be built strong enough to carry an 18 wheeler or, or a log truck up through there. It could be a lesser standard, but the problem becomes down the road if somebody begins to use it for a purpose other than what it was originally improved for. How do you stop that use? It's a class four road, it's open to the public. So now you're left with a, a road that's all chewed up because it was built for one purpose and now it's being used for another. Uh, increased traffic, whatever the case may be. So. There's, there's no there's no magic answer tonight. I, I think this gives us a good starting place. I think we can come up with some some options uh, based on use that don't require you know hundred thousand dollars to improve a, a class four road to to move up through for farming purposes. I mean, we're we're talking about right at this point. There's two roads in town that are being talked about. One is off um, the name's escaping my well, Round Terrell Road. Uh, Ross Hill uh, and in the Bull Moose Road. So, um, where there's a, a mutual interest, I think, in all the parties involved in the Bull Moose Road uh, to see the road opened up and improved, the question comes how well do you construct the road? How much does the town require the road to be built to carry, you know, based on the, the usage that you're going to see there? And that if the usage changes, is there a, something in the policy that says there needs to come back and require new permissions? Perhaps a, a restructuring the road if the conditions change. And of course, anything I bring to you, I'm going to have it run by the attorney to make sure we're not overstepping our bounds uh, in doing so. So I can, I can continue to work on this. I can continue to make some improvements to this in those areas in particular, because I think that's one of the holdups that I can see happening. Uh, is how well do you construct the road? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, for the rest of its life, it's, it's going to be a, a farm access. It doesn't necessarily need to have a you know, eight-inch minus stone base and then gravel layered on top of it, filter fabric and everything else. So, I think we can uh, we might be able to build some different options into this. But I, I just from what you're saying, I can understand why logging activities might be a separate entity here. When you're talking about a skitter and so it's a lot more um, rough usage of the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. What's your name, sir? We love beer. <laughs> uh, like the Bull Moose Road, uh, that beginning going up to the Rooney Fields fills up with snow eight feet high. Drift, yeah. And there's no... And in the spring, when things melt, everything comes down there where you've got huge ruts, you know, just uh, washed away. So, for instance, if Rooney's had to go up there uh, with their equipment, which they do, I mean, they've got to hay and bring the cows up and stuff. Uh, you can't expect them to fix the road to any semblance of what it should be. You know, I mean, that would be t way too costly for it. Uh, it's still bringing up farm equipment and they might be able to drop a load of gravel in there or something, but you can't expect them to 
fix that road. Yeah. Right. You know, it would be too costly. And, uh, but <clears throat> still, they have to use it. That's the only way up to their fields. Right. And keep in mind that we're talking about all class four roads. So it's not just one or two in town. We have to be cognizant that whatever we're doing it's going to affect all class four right. roads. I agree, Judy, but you need a little uh, reasonable understanding of what each one has to go through. I mean, it's not like the Beaver Meadow Road where you go up to the landing, uh, which you're not supposed to drive up there anyway, mm -hmm. but people do. You know, it's a, a different purpose. It's for uh, cross-country skiing, or it's for hiking, or something. But this is for a person's living, which you can't make them have the same. Yeah. That's why I said to, it's very hard to create a policy that's going to cover every scenario. It's a difficult thing. We don't want to put together a policy where we have to go upgrade all the roads too and exhaust our highway department trying to keep them at that level, whatever that is, you know, so. I remember before 1985 when we had the big flood, you could go all around the Beaver Meadows Circle and come out at Brian's Pond Road. Right, I remember that. And you could drive mm -hmm. all the way around. Good for a Jeep, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And then uh, uh, they know. had the big flood in 85, and well, that washed out everything. Mm -hmm. So. Understood. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and I always thought that a class four road now was designated as a trail. No, there's a, that's a lower level. That's a lower, that's if we downgraded it. It would be the trail. Trail's the lowest. The lowest. Thank you. Joe Streeter from Marshall. Um, my question is, so as it stands now, um, as far as plowing for access to our home or whatever, or if a tree were to come down, which happens occasionally, we, we can take care of that without any worry about any liability in the town. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'd say is um, our road, the Grand Terrell Road that we live on, we've had mixes, we've had cement trucks, we've had the fire department up here, the brush forest, we've had logging. They used to build roads. I mean, the base of that road has never, even in the flood, it never washed. But as it stands now, if that culvert goes out again, Kevin, would you guys repair that or not? Yes. As it stands now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. <coughs> Go ahead, sir. Hi, you guys. Mm -hmm. My name is Alec Fonseca. I live in Bumus Road, and I want to talk about a little bit about my house. My house is sitting right in the road, like real close, and it's an old house, like how you roll. The base is uh, rocks. So I need somebody to be liable in case a big machine shake my house and my house fall down. Somebody be, gotta be liable. Could be where to run permit or where build the roads. Because when I bought the property, the house was already sitting there. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, we are not against to anyone who apply the road. We actually kind of want it because if this thing happened, we will put houses or cabins up there in my upper fields and I will rent them, I will promote a co or you call it agro tourism. So in the end, I also need it, but I need it done in the right way. That's all that we asked him for. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Just a second. Yes, Parker Phillips. Um, I actually own 50 acres up at the end of Beaver Meadow Road. And so when I bought the property, it was on the Class 4 road. So I didn't expect any maintenance or have to pay for anything. But I also didn't expect to, if I need access, vehicular access to my property, wasn't expecting to have to upgrade to a class three road because class four roads are unmaintained as of right now. So that's all I'm saying is that the primary purpose of a class four road 
is not cross country skiing. It is not snowshoeing. It is for vehicles. And I have no problem with it. The snowmobile tra trail comes right down. I have no problem with if I came for a winter access permit that snowmobiles are allowed to go through there. I'd rather go up on a snowmobile or an ATV anyway in the winter. Only if I had, I just don't want to get into a scenario where I get expropriated out of my access to my land. That's my major concern. And in a scenario where people live on these roads, you can't, if you pass a policy that makes them come and wait 20, 30, 10, and they've got a, a tree across the road, a culvert out, they are not going to follow that policy. They're going to get to their house. There's liability. They, they live there. So there's crops. There's animals. I have to maintain my current use with logging. I need a log truck to get up there. That has happened in the past. So there's just a lot of complexity to it. And I just want to make sure the class four roads policy doesn't morph into a control of land policy. We have DRB. We have development. We have that process for that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Selena. Selena Rooney, Glen City. Um, I'm having a hard time like thinking about the policy when it's been a month and we still haven't had a request to upgrade our road answered yet. In that month's time, we harvested almost 100 cords of wood. We put out I don't know how much milk but we still haven't had this request answered, despite the fact that I have explained why it's time sensitive. There are seasons in farming. Right now, it is the end of logging season. And next week, sometime this week, starts sugaring season. Once sugaring season starts, we're not going to be able to cut the trees. So what I'd like to do tonight is ask the select board permission just for the tree aspect of the, of the road upgrade. Nothing about the specifications of what we need to do to the road, but I'd like to get the trees cut now before it's too late. Um, if we can't get the trees cut now, it might mean that we're not able to have enough feed for our cows this winter. Um, the the uh, further field in the bullmoose pasture is used for first cut, and that first cut is put in our bunker, and that's what the cows eat all winter. So if we can't get that because more spill is holding us up, that's a problem. So I'd really like to ask you to vote on, can we cut the trees tonight? And then um, we will sign whatever liability waiver that Jim Barlow draws up. We will be completely liable for anything that happens. Um, I just feel like we're being treated unfairly. I mean, Joe's still plowing his road based on the old policy, but we're not able to follow the old policy to get the, the upgrades. Bob, you mentioned that a policy can't cover everything. Well, your old policy actually did. Your old policy said select board approval. So the select board would sit and hear everything individually. And that's really what needs to be ha happening because every single person that lives on a class four road in Morrisville has a different perspective and they have different needs for that road. Um, to the rest of Morrisville, class four roads are not important. But for those of us that use class four roads, they're extremely important. It's a big part of our life. Um, and I think it's important that the select board look at every single aspect on an individual basis. So we come and ask for permission. Every side gets to prevent, present its story. Um, and then you guys can make a decision. And that way we're not stuck into, OK, you have to upgrade it to this level, even though you're just trying to get your farm equipment up. The um, biggest equipment that we have going up through there when we the bunker is a mowing machine that's 16 feet wide, so we really do need the road widened up to get it up through there. We have no other way to access those fields, um, so this is something that has to happen um, now. I really don't think that the town should be looking at liability as the biggest issue. I think liability is important, but it's not the top of top importance. If, if you're just basing your actions on liability, then you probably won't let mountain bikers through there because that's a huge liability. I mean, if we're cutting the trees to get them out of the way and we have to stop, all of a sudden mountain biker comes zooming down through, hits a tree and wipes out. Is the town then liable? I don't think liability should be the biggest thing that you're looking at. I think you should be looking at what is the use. 
and the importance of that use. And you know, that, that road does not go all the way through and come out on Rontero Road. It really only goes a short distance, turns down into the field where the brown car used to be. So it's a pretty short road. We allow um, people to use that trail on our property for hiking and biking and skiing and horseback riding and snowshoeing and mountain biking and skidooing and you name it. And if we just thought of liability as our most important thing to look at, we would have to put an end to that because there's just too much liability. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is how's it being used and how many people are using it. Um, municipalities by the um, Vermont right to farm laws cannot regulate required agricultural practices. One required agricultural practice is um, maintaining the roads to your, your fields. So by not allowing us to cut the trees, it is actually regulating our required agricultural practice, which goes against the Vermont right to farm rules that were set out in 1985. So tonight I would just like to ask the five of you to vote on if we can have the ability to cut the trees now. Um, we will sign any liability waivers that you want us to so that in the future we can look at upgrading it so that this spring we can get our first cut hay done. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Selena, I have just a couple of questions for you. How, how you said you need it to be 16 feet. How wide is that stretch of bull moose that you need to access right presently? I'm um, sorry. I didn't say we needed it to be 16 feet. We needed, talking to Kenny Grimes, who looked at it on Friday, um, 20 to 25 feet wide. Um, the 16 feet is just the width of the mower okay. itself. Um, and is, um, sorry, so, and this is on Bull Moose Road? Yes. Um, and is it something that, like, grew up, like the trees grew up and then? Yes. Okay. The last time we had the same exact thing done was um, 1999. We had it widened up to this um, width for logging activities um, that were taking place up by the old sugar house. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been 23 years. Mm -hmm. But we still, I mean, we have a lot of excavator work. Just five years ago, we did some excavator work on the hill part that comes down to Mud City Loop because it washes out so much. And so I just have one more question for Selena. But um, besides cutting the trees, what else needs to be done? Um, Kenny looked at it and um, he said he couldn't tell us exactly what he could do until he knew what the town policies were or how much it would be costing us. But it needs to be um, a ditch put in some culverts just because the water just keeps washing right down through it. You know, anytime we do work, we have a water bar like a third of the way up. Anytime we do work, um, it just really erodes the, the dirt because there is, there's not a ditch on the left hand side and there's not a culvert. So it probably needs one or two culverts. And you're willing to pay the price to get that done? Yes. So I'm Alexia Mazel. I live with Alex. Our farm is also a working farm, and it's also completely our livelihood. And so we've just been here for just over a year, and are working on developing our project. So we're still in the building phase, but it's pretty much what we do also. And um, we definitely are not trying to block Selena from getting where you know where we where we both would like to go. In a way, just like Alex said, uh, our house is 125 years old with a rubble basement. With it's kind of sketchy. So our main concern is, you know, making sure no compactor or anything vibrates that. We have garages on the other side from our house because we can't afford to build real garages. They're temporary buildings, and you know, we want to make sure no trees. We can't afford to replace them either. We just want to make sure trees, if they're cut, don't get. You know, if somebody smashes them, like I can't buy a new garage, so <laughs> somebody can buy a new garage or if my basement beams get damaged or my foundation gets damaged to the to our house, somebody somebody's got us covered because we don't got us covered if that happens to us. And uh, also our field where you know if, if Selena is able to uh, do any work on that now or in the future, um that's not, you know, we're not to opposed to that totally. The one minus for us there is it's our 25 feet on either side of the road that we're losing. 
and sets us back a little more from where we can build, like we'll probably have to move at least 100 raspberry bushes and maybe parts of our other field that we planted last year forward. But we can adjust you know, for, for those things. And we have a row of trees, which affords us privacy in our field for where we want to you know, host different activities and events from people that are going by or things. So we lose all those trees. Some of them are maple trees. We also sugar. Um, and so, you know, we're like, so we're out those trees, so we're gonna have to repurchase like some white pine or something like that that grows fast and replant them. So, you know, I understand you you're, have a big need there, but we also are gonna, you know, experience a loss by losing those things. And it's part of our plan for working on our farm, which, you know, we bought that land because we wanted a farm and we want to work in the farm business. My husband grew up farming in Costa Rica, multi-generational farmer also. And, you know, it's important to us to maintain the character of where we live and help promote agritourism and keep the character of where we are. It's, you know, we want to find a good solution that works good for us, where we're protected and our house isn't getting damaged. I'm like, I don't know, like, can someone, someone buy some white pine trees to like keep our privacy of our field? Because that's part of, how we'll make money with agro-tourism when, when you're laid bare like that, you're less attractive. So we just want to make sure our exposure is minimized so you know we can both get what we want. And we totally agree because we have we are trying to manage that washout all the time. And it, it messes up Mud City Loop, that washout does, and it messes up our driveway. And we wanted to fix our driveway, didn't get to it this year because we would have need to go before you guys to whatever, present our plan, we just didn't get to it with all of our other projects. But, you know, we definitely want to work with solution. But like Alex said, it's super important to us because our house and the side of our foundation of our house literally sits on that road and it's only just 16 feet wide there. So how you widen it and also if we have to, we just put our garages up. We have to do the labor and everything and work to move all of that back. It's, you know, it's, it's a big impact for you guys financially and stuff like that too. And it, it's also to us, so. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where we can land to work it out, but uh, you know, it, it's it's two farms, not just one, not like some tourist here from Philly or a rental home. It's a we are also a farm, and that is also what we do and what we intend on doing into the future. So we want to make sure, and I know everybody here is really working to come up with a good solution that protects both of us, so I, I, you know, that's what the slowdown is because nobody wants to come out the loser with that, especially not me because our, you know, Alex and my house sit huh, like directly on that road and that road that is widest is, is 16 feet right at the bottom. So I'm not exactly sure, you know, what our answer is. And yeah, I don't, I don't know what, what more to say, but it, it's a, there's a lot on the line for us too. Thank you. <clears throat> Lee, then you can go, Joe. Isn't it my understanding is the, a town road is 24.9 feet from the center line? No, I don't. Right. Three grows. 24.75. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> On each side. Okay, from the center line. 49 and a half feet from the full right away. So there shouldn't be a problem cutting the trees. But if the beginning of the road is only 16 feet wide from where their house and their garage is sitting, then there seems to be an issue. I, don't I think know. Lee's point is what? what's the right of way? What's the town right of way from there? Right? It's still a town road, no matter how you put it. And somebody put a house right there as you drive in on the left. Uh, well, it's been there 125 years. Somebody didn't plop it there last year. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. The town still has that road and it's 24.75 feet on each side. So if it comes up to your basement, that's tough. I believe eminent domain would be a whole nother legal can of worms that I don't think anybody Ma'am, if you're going to speak, you got to come to the microphone. Please don't Sorry. do it from the audience. 
I, I think that, you know, yes, uh, the, we are well aware that the road is 25 feet on both sides, but I don't think anybody wants to get, you know, involved in an eminent domain battle. Uh, so that's not anybody's goal here. That's certainly not my goal. <laughs> and, not you know, who cares if your 125-year-old house is there or farm or any of your project? The, it's public interest, not a person's interest. So I certainly look to have this worked out in everybody's interest. Because frankly, like Alex said, having a road up there that is a good road serves us as well. Hopefully but yeah, you mean we know we can make a, a, a farm, a, an accessory on farm business project. Great, that'll help us when we have the money to do that down the road. But you know, it, it's eminent domain is about public interest, not about a person's interest. Thank you, Joe. Go ahead, and then you can sign up. <clears throat> I think the impact that the Roonies would do, I mean, if there's ever been a land steward, it's been the Roonies, and I think your impact would be minimal. We're trying to get some trees out of the way. They're not trying to blow an interstate up through to their ground field. I think that you can trust the Roonies to do a good job. Yeah, Thanks, Joe. I was waiting for you, Tom. You've been quiet for a while. <laughs> yeah, been thinking about what you're going to say, haven't you? No, I know. After you think about it, everybody knows it. the Rooney Farm up there is is part of Marsville. That's right. And and we could talk all of sit here for the next two months. We're here to do what is right, and what is right is letting the Rooneys get to their crops so their farm doesn't they don't lose their farm. That's what's right. And I don't have to think about that. And we're sorry, you know, we, the Rooneys certainly... Uh, don't, please don't speak to yeah, them. Yeah, don't speak to them. Speak to us. Speak to us. Speak to us. They are land trust people. They're not going to destroy anybody, no. their neighbors. And they're certainly not going to destroy their land. They, they, don't worry about them. You can worry about policy later. Tonight, let her get it. Right. Thanks, Tom. Bob, Bob. So, I just we're looking for we're looking for solutions. Multiple people have said that they're looking for reasonable solutions. I know this little section of land and this little road pretty well, and the Roonies have not accessed those fields on this road for a number of years. Is that correct, Selena? Not with big equipment, just with, we drive up with our trucks. But well, you've been getting in there other ways. Yeah. And if I'm correct, you've been doing that along what is presently a snow machine trail? Yes. So that seems to me to be a solution to allow the Roonies to access that field this summer until we can straighten this out. They've been doing it for, I don't know how long David's no, been driving. Let me, let, let, me, let me finish, please. I don't know how long David's been accessing that field, or how long the Roonies have been doing it. It's not just David, obviously. But this has all come to an end. That's why we're here, because they can't get through the way that they've always been able to get through. That seems to me to be the, an obvious solution. I happen to live beside a working farm and I have no problem granting access on my fields to a couple of individuals that are in the room, it happens. I, I just think that's an easy solution. And in the meantime, the town, the select board, our lawyers, and everyone involved with an interest can sort through this. I feel like we're I feel like we're in a time crunch. I feel like we're having to make a decision. I think I know where I'm gonna go in the next five or ten minutes, but it would be a lot easier if we just all did the right thing and for right now maybe create a situation where the Rooney Farm can access that backfield like they always have for twenty twenty three. So can you clar clarify, is the backfield on the new property, is it on the new property owners, it's a new property owner's field that they're, now they're not allowed to access? And so that's why 
Runes want to the Runes used to access their field by going across the, the, the property that Alex and Alexia own. Okay. Yeah, that's why I want to clarify the point because when we bought property, it is true. The Runes used to use our farm to get to their fields. We also gave them permission to put a fence in the upper, I mean, the lower part of our farm so they can grow their cows to the upper fields. And also they used our main gate to bring the bailer out there. Everything changed. In the moment, the Selena Looney and the Lonnie Davis came to my house to start my project because I went to put a septic tank in my field because I put a small shop. And my neighbor says that they are not agree with that. They want to take away my right to farm my own land. And that's not right. So that's when it happened, this whole issue. That's why we didn't allow them anymore to cross our fields. Selena Q said that she want to put a well right in our limit, which is like 300 feet away from my septic tank. And it is a wetland. Besides that, it's a creek. I know that there is some regulation about that. My neighbor said that he doesn't want me to put my septic tank because he hates people. He doesn't want to see anybody driving in front of his barn. Too bad we have the right to travel in this country. I'm not making that up. I still go back to, I, I've heard that story, but it seems to me like we're saying that we're looking for a solution. I think we have a solution. Like, I think we can solve this problem quickly, unless I'm missing something. I'll shut up for a while. Go ahead, Tanya. Okay. Um, he's right. I did ask them that they not put their isolation zone for their septic onto our farm and onto our neighbor's property. I didn't want their isolation zone on my property. I asked them that. I did not demand it. Um, I just nicely asked because there's not a whole lot I can do about it except nicely ask and try to convince them to put um, the isolation zone in their very dry field, um, which would be a much better spot than the wet area that Alex was talking about. And two minutes into the conversation, um, I get blackmailed with, if you put a stock for a project, we will tear down your fence with our tractor. Now, we put our fence where they asked us to put our fence because it's not been surveyed. We don't know exactly where the border is, and it was easier to go at the bottom of their field. They showed us exactly where they wanted the fence, but they tore it down and sent us a picture um, of our fence in a pile with a certified letter that said, we're not able to cross their property, neither are any of our helpers or associates. So no, I will not be crossing that property. I will be accessing it through the access that I have, which is the class four town road. Now, Judy, to answer your question, the 16 feet is not between their house and their garage. That's much, much bigger. So we won't be hurting their house at all. We won't be hurting their temporary garages at all. I mean, I don't think it's right that they put the temporary garages in the town right away, but we can get around it. There's plenty of room to get through there with our new roads. So that's not a problem. Thank you. Where do we go from We're here? Still about this. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Selena's correct. That that the, I don't. I think that you can get past that our garages without that. Our main concern is our foundation of our 125 year old house, and that you know, yeah, you're not like super sized machines. We could definitely work around that. You know, there's certain tree roots, and um, our garages are pretty far back. The main concern is our foundations of our house with any type of machinery that goes through there. That there's no concern for us. The trees don't get dropped onto those garages. And the, the losing that tree line, you know, there's maples on there, there's stuff that we use, and it's our privacy and our field's privacy and our work is, you know, what solution can be come up with there for us? I don't know. I mean, maybe in, in this whole issue is another separate meeting on our road on another day so that we're not taking everybody's time everywhere. Because we do want to come to, you know, something that, that works something out, you know. So, you know, I'm certainly amenable to not, you know, forcing something today and walk, going out there and actually looking at it and coming up with a, 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 an answer as soon as possible. Thank you. <clears throat> what do you folks want to do? Where are we, where are we at now? I, I think you're right, Celine. I think, um, when I said it's very hard to, to cover, have a policy to cover every scenario, and it is, that's very true. I do agree with you that 
issues should be case by case scenario, you know, and should be decided on by the select board. That's one of the things we're here for. We're governing that stuff. Anything to do with the town and town roads, we should have to say. As long as we, we know our legal counsel says it's okay, we should be able to decide what we want. You know, this this decision for that road and this decision for that road, they could be different. They don't all have to be exactly the same. So that's how I feel. Um, and that's the way I think agreements can happen. I mean, I see some hostility in the room back and forth, a little bit of grumbling. But I think there is a, a way to have everybody be happy. You know, I like the idea that you had Kenny Grimes take a look at it. And if, if all of us would have a site walk, I'm not suggesting it, but if we could see it right in front of us, you could hash it out and say, look, you know, I'm going to have to take this tree and that one, but well, that's enough room for me to get my farm equipment in. You know, I think that's the way that we want to be. We want to be able to make it so you can, you can work together and come up with a solution without being grumbly neighbors back and forth, you know. Any decision we make, either or, can make one of the neighbors upset. And, and I think it's better to have a, a mediation where you can say, okay, are you happy with that? Are you happy with that? Let's do it. Uh, that, that's just my two cents. Tony, you had a comment? Amazing, yeah. isn't it? So, I live two miles from the Rooney Farm, and I think uh, if she needs to cut those trees, they need to be cut. And I also think anybody that cuts trees, whoops, I ain't supposed to look. Anybody that cuts trees knows what they're doing, and they're not going to hurt that house or the barn or the garage. So let's get the trees cut so they can get their farm equipment up there, and let's get on with this. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I think what I'm struggling with um, as a select board member is that I'm not um, sure if we are, it sounds like we're talking about a policy versus um, we're talking about a dispute between um, landowners. Mm -hmm. And I can say that, like, personally, I, um, I, want the, um, the, the agricultural use, and also like as a select board member, the agricultural use um, to continue the Rooney, um, I want the Rooney, farmer, the Rooney farm to be able to access that road. Um, what I'm concerned about is that, are we just making a decision about this one instance, or are we setting a precedent? Um, I'm con I don't understand if it's our purview to be mediating this kind of dispute, or if um, if we can just say, you know, it's the town right of way. Um, the Rooneys have the right to cut those trees. Like, um, if if it had just ma been maintained over the years, no one ever would have noticed that. Um, it would it would be a no brainer. It would just be like some brush hogging, and now they have happen to have grown up or since 1999. I I guess my question is like. Is it under the board's purview to decide um, decide this question? Um, because I, do, I I hear Selena saying that um, there is a there is a seasonality to the farm work, and that you know sugaring is going to start in a week. And I also hear um, the um, the neighbors saying, you know, we're concerned about our our home. I so I um, I guess. I, I don't quite understand um, how we move forward. I'm, I'm, you know. I think you're correct in saying we've gotten involved into a neighbor's dispute. But it's about a town road. It's about a it's town about road. Town. Yeah. Is, are all the trees you're talking about, Selena, on your property that you'd be cutting? They're all on her property and our property. Sorry. Um, but they're all within the town right away. Right. The trees that we're cutting are owned by the town. So I'd like a vote tonight because tonight is really the last chance that we have to get these trees cut in a timely manner. I've been waiting a month. The skitter's been sitting on our property for 10 days without moving. I'd like an answer tonight. Well, I just, I want to clarify you. The trees are yours, are the property owners. The town owns the right of way, which gives them the right to cut them. But the trees are owned by the person that holds the, the deed. And that's not the town. The town has a right of way over them. Our lawyer said the town owns the trees. That's not true. Because I've been in a situation like that, and the right of way for the town, we have a right of way over that. But that doesn't mean the town owns those trees. You know, because we get tons of people, and 
to, to have trees, their favorite apple tree in the right away. We cut it down and they go nuts. And there can be a lawsuit. You can cut them, but those trees belong to the landowner. Okay. Now, Regardless, I'd like you to right. work tonight if we can cut the trees. We right. can't. We're not going to take the full 50 feet right away. We want like 20 or 25 feet. Where we're going through by her house, it's going to be a lot more narrow, but then we'll open it up. We can't, we can't give you permission to cut trees on someone else's property, though. Yes, it's a town right away, so you can. That's what <laughs> Bob is saying. Bob, can well, I make a suggestion? Yeah. I'm, I'm willing to go up. Kenny Grimes is the contractor that the Rooney's have contacted. Uh, with, with all the parties interested, I'm going to go up there with Kenny and them. Let's look at the road together as a group. We'll flag the trees that need to be cut by Kenny's estimation, maintaining the center line of the road, so it's going to be both sides of the road. We'll see if we can come up with an agreement between all parties. That's and, then, right. and then I will, rather than wait for another board meeting, I will contact all the board members with the the result of this thing. So that I mean that I, if I can, if in order to meet timelines, but also try and find a resolution of this thing, that perhaps we could do it that way. Can we do it soon? Like right. Uh, my my point is is the bo the board is left with a road, and you're there's no standard as to what you want the class four road to build be built by. Our current road policy only says what we won't do to maintain the road. Right. It doesn't talk about private entities wanting to improve the road for any other structure. So that piece needs to be figured out. I think working with Kenny Grimes, I've known Kenny for decades, and he has a great reputation. I think if we listen to what he has to say for a recommendation for the building of the road up through, that it would perhaps not relieve the entire liability, but it were in better shape. Uh, local contractor, very knowledgeable, and we can get this thing uh, put to rest. I think for right now they're just talking about cutting the trees. So if we can get together with all the parties up there and tag the trees that need to go according to Kenny in order to build the, the finished product, then that's the starting point we need to get to. If if we can find a starting point. I don't know if we can. And then we go back to looking at the class four prop. And we can continue to look at the class four policy yeah, separately, but I'm just trying to get up there. Yeah. If we can get all parties to agree on which trees need to be cut in order and with Kenny's guidance in order to get the road built, then that gets us closer. And then as, if I have all parties giving me a north and south head nod, I will contact the board members directly and let you know the end result. Okay. And then if the board decides by, by poll, we can bring it back up on the next agenda. But I'm telling you, if, if through a telephone survey of you, if you all agree to go with the plan as Kenny describes it, then I can give the permission for them from the board to have the trees cut. This can happen quick. It just depends on getting schedules yep. put together. So we don't have to wait till another board meeting. To I, I'm to offering to, to, to go up there and, and try and work through this thing and try and find a solution on that road that protects all interests and, and marks the trees that would need to be cut in order for Kenny to build the road up through there. Is Kenny doing the cutting? No. No. Okay. But the contract, it's a logging. It, it's not the Rooney loggers. It's a, you've contracted the <coughs> logger, is that? We do, and they are, all four of our loggers are sugar makers as well as us, so they're not going to be available. We need to do it now. It's now or never. <coughs> so I'd like a vote, please. I'm just sitting here looking at this because the next time I need to get a log truck or something up into my property, it's a road. I, I understand someone has, they are concerned about it, but it's starting to meld into, I want something for this. Mm -hmm. And that ain't what roads are about. The select board has the authority to approve cutting those trees. I understand you're in a no-win situation, but that's your job. Right? right? I mean, no one's going to be, you know, at buying a house is that close to, but when you buy a house within 20 something feet of a class four road, that's what comes with it. And so at the end of the day, I just want to make sure we're not getting into this too arbitrary zone when it comes to roads. VRB is arbitrary enough. We have to do that for development purposes, but roads are roads. They're three rods wide. I understand there's going to be aesthetic trees cut there, but that's where we're at. Thank you. 
All right. Does that open the select board up for the town up to a liability if we, do, if we choose? Mm -hmm. If we say, yep, go ahead. Well, it does if the trees fall on their house or their garage or right. something like that, then it would be a liability. Mm -hmm. Or damages. Like yeah, or damage or the foundation crumbles because of it, that kind of thing. But Selena, but that's, Selena when, would you, when would you start cutting? Tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, Selah says she's willing to have you take the liability risk. She already said that. Yeah. That, she and said that she's taking the liability risk. Yeah. I mean, I would have liked to have also been informed, like, exactly, you know, didn't, you know, say, I, I need to cut. Yeah, to have some parameter of idea of where you're going to cut. I'm, I'm sure you can work around our, our house and stuff. And basically, yeah, but we, I mean, do you have a document ready tomorrow that says, hey, don't worry if it if smash your garage or, you know, if uh, something from vibration or whatever damage your structure of your home, we got you covered. In that case, have at it, you know, because like we said, ultimately, although we lose privacy and stuff like that, we'll work with that. We'll okay. move our stuff, you know, because the road eventually will serve us. So we're not trying to stop you there. We just, all we're asking for, you know, eventually that benefits our farm. All we're asking for is protection for our home. and. That is it. We're not like trying to go like, plant those new trees or anything, you know. Uh, that's going to be my, my me. Yeah. But, you know, the, you know, yes, those are my trees. They fall. That's my wood, too. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I, it would have been nice if you wanted to do it tomorrow if you came up today because we're both around and said, like, hey, whoop, it's going to be all of these or whatever. And now you're like saying you have to show up within one day, uh, you know. I'm, if Eric can go up there tomorrow, I'm home. <laughs> you know? Thank you. I think we've had enough discussion. Yeah, does somebody want to make a motion? Um, I don't want to make a motion. I'll make a motion. I make a motion that the select board um, allows the Roonies to cut the trees that will, um, on um, in the right of way of Bull Moose Run to allow um, the passage of their farm equipment. And they're willing to accept the and liability. And they are willing to accept the liability for any damage to um, the, um, the adjacent property. I'll second that. All right. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I, I would like to say, excuse me one sec, Joe. But I'd just like to say, boy, I'd love there to be another solution here. I still like what I threw out. Um, best. I like Eric's idea, second best, and this is perhaps third best, um, but I, I, I feel bad that the select board's been pushed into making this decision, but as many of you have expressed, well, I guess we do, because it's our job so to like do that. I'd like to say something too before we go. I feel the same way Don does. I wish we could have fixed this a different way. Mm -hmm. We don't like to see neighbors fighting, but I do think we have the right to do what we're doing because it is a town road, so my thoughts. Go ahead, Joe. I just had one thing to say, I'm sorry. It's, it's yeah, probably going to hear it again, but I guess my question to the uh, homeowner is... No, no, you're good. Only does. My right. question would be, what's the current condition of their foundation? That's yeah. the We want to hire an uh, engineer to do a study and give you a study in All right, come on, Tom. And I'm talking behind my back. Selena Rooney is saying that she is responsible for what's going to happen. You can take that to the bank. You don't have to worry about it. Any, any piece of paper or anything. Yeah, you can't talk. Look at us. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. enough. Let's vote on it. Exactly. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Four to one. The motion passes. Finally. Well, not finally. But. All right. So then we will, we will continue to look at the town road file. Let's just leave it at that for tonight. Selena, is that okay? All right, next, approve the warrants. I'll make a motion we approve the warrants. Second. I have a motion and a second. 
All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The warrants have passed. TA report. Uh, pretty brief. I met with uh, Representative Sanders, people that uh, work here in Vermont. Uh, he's sending his folks around just to the municipalities to discuss any concerns they have that Senator Sanders may be able to impact. Uh, I brought two uh, concerns uh, to their level. One was uh, the monies for the building of municipal structures, uh, highway garages, public safety buildings, and so on. Those are in our near future, and they're expensive. And I don't know how the tax base is going to be able to support such a thing. A lot of money went out the door for infrastructure during COVID, and none of it was allowed to be used to build municipal office buildings. So um, that's what I sent back up that way. Uh, the second one was, as we are constructing our downtown, increasing population in our downtown, transportation is a definite issue. I encourage them to support RCT as it is and the service they provide, anything that you do to that. We're a small municipality, we can't afford our own bus service and bus line and bus routes. RCT is a valuable service, so uh, I did say the transportation is going to become more of an issue uh, around here. If we want folks to be able to be around their village without a motor vehicle, then they're still going to need transportation because Price Shopper is a long ways to carry four or five bags of groceries from and get to our village. Mm -hmm. We followed that up a couple days later. Todd and I met with the new uh, director, relatively new director of RCT. They are uh, going to a, a microtransport uh, system. It was in the newspaper last week uh, where it's going to be on call in town, point to point in town, uh, not long, long range. So that <coughs> service is, uh, is beginning to come to fruition and uh, looking to partner with them to be able to provide more information as to what they offer. Uh, we have some they didn't leave brochures. They did not leave brochures yet. It was the Sanders folks left brochures. Um, is that a subsidized? Was, Sorry, is that a subsidized? Their rides are free. Uh -huh. When you get on an RCT, yep. it is free. It is subsidized, yes. And so the Uber type ones would be I'm sorry. So these Uber type rides would be free as well? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Would it be you said would it be the town and the village, the whole thing, or just the village? It would be the whole thing. I mean, if you if somebody's at the Copley Terrace and they want to go to the grocery store, they can call our C T and schedule that to happen, and they'll come pick you up and take you over there, and then take you back home when you're done. What about the mini? You're talking about the mini rides. It's a, no, it's a micro transit micro, system. Yeah. Yeah, that's and that just that's that's a point to point by call. They're not allowed to because they have federal money. They're not allowed to compete against for profit entities. So okay. they have to be very careful about the line they walk. So they're looking to downsize vehicles rather than drive the great big Garmin bus with all the fuel going through it for two people. They're looking to downsize vehicles and have a multitude of vehicles available based on rider requests. So that's uh, trying to trim their bottom line a little bit too. Okay. Do you have anything more? No, nope. that's it. Okay, thank did you. you. Did you just ask if it's for the town also or just the village? That's yes, for everything. Fantastic. It was for everything. So, if somebody lives up on Cody Hill, yeah. they're allowed to. That's right. Free. It's an RCT. Yes, RC. I was shocked. Lee. I yeah. had no that's, idea RC, that's true. RCTs ride for free. I knew that. Uh, I did not. But uh, we're we're partnering more with them. This new director is a uh, go-getter. Yeah. And uh, so I'm going to get more information from him so we so can get it out. If you need a ride, just call me, Lee. I'll come get you. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun during mud season. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got? That's it for me. That's it. Any questions for Eric? Thanks, Eric. Um, select board concerns. Don. Well, <clears throat> usually I'm pretty short and sweet. I might not be tonight. Uh, well, it was probably about two months ago. I was looking at one of the agendas that Eric and Judy put out, looking at select board concerns and thinking, boy, what an, what an, odd, what an odd way to put that. You know, it should be select board comments or select board information or feedback. But I guess tonight I do have some concerns, so I guess it is actually a very appropriate term. We just had uh, 
I just had a pretty good discussion here. I was going to talk about cordiality and decency. I think we did have a very cordial discussion. I think we had a very decent discussion. I'm very happy about that. I do worry a little bit about what's going to happen in the next month. I know the budget is extremely contentious. It is for all of us. And I just want to remind people that it's, it's about disagreements, yes, but it's not about persons. It's not about people. It's not about individuals. It's not about names. Remember, well, these people that work for our town, they have husbands and they have wives, and God forbid they have children that have to listen to these comments. I think that's really, really important for us to remember. I have, in my tenure on this board, met a lot of people working for this town. I haven't met them all, but I've met a bunch of them, and I can tell you, without exception, there are tremendous people working for this town and getting stuff done for us. And I, I welcome you to do the same. Get, get to know these people. Get to know what they're doing. There's a lot of good stuff going on here. And they're earning their salaries. I'm going to talk a little bit more about salaries in a second. But they're earning their salaries. Debatable whether or not we're actually paying them enough. Transparency, a word I don't like. It's a political term that has lots of different meanings, but there's been suggestions about a lack of transparency by this board. <clears throat> and maybe it's, well, I'll take personal object objection to it. I haven't been untransparent, that's for sure. Um, there's nothing going on behind the scenes. There's nothing going on behind locked doors. There's nothing going on nefarious. Just the opposite. And this, of course, all is around the issue of the budget. We had we started budget meetings the first week of December, approximately. Last week of November. November, Tina. November. November. Yeah. November. And we had very few people in this room. Mm -hmm. There's two people that are present here tonight that were at every single one of those meetings. I don't think there's anybody other than those two individuals that were at every one of those meetings. Most of those meetings, when I looked at the public, I could count everybody on one hand. And that's fine. I get it. I understand. That's that's fine. We're all busy. We got to a point there in early January where we knew we were passing a really tough budget. In fact, Tommy Gardner quoted me as saying, this is huge. This is a huge number. I didn't get a phone call from anybody. I didn't get an email from anybody. I'll send I didn't get requests from anybody for any information. The information was all out there. Then we, as a select board, decided remember this so clearly, that what we needed to do was we needed to get public involvement. We needed to get people out to these meetings. And thank you for coming, because I know some of you are here tonight because of the budget. And we then asked Bob, our chair, and Eric to sit down with Tommy Gardner and put an article in the paper. And since we've done that, we've gotten, an all, we've gotten all kinds of attention. Most of it not terribly positive, but we kind of knew that. But the word's out there. And we needed to get the word out there. People needed to know what was going on. Back in November, December, early January, it was about budget development. It wasn't about voting in a budget. But we did make that tough choice, and we voted in a budget. We started, I'll throw some numbers out there, we started with a 40% budget, which is nuts. We cut a third of it. And that's where we're at right now. We're down to 28%, which is still a huge number. We all understand that. I'm concerned about this. I'm a taxpayer. We're all taxpayers in here. We all tax we're all paying taxes. My taxes are going up. My neighbor's taxes are going up, I know. But we're now at a point where the cuts get really difficult. And those two individuals that were at every single one of those meetings, those budget meetings, they each said, boy, I don't know where else you guys are going to cut. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just us, but I'm not putting it on them. Look, what's driving this budget is inflation and salaries. I just got my new health insurance. It went up 30%. 
There's a whole, and you know, I, I know people on, I know plenty of people on fixed incomes. Their health insurance went up 30%. I don't get to vote on that. But we do. We get to vote on the budget, and that's important. And I know many people have talked about that, and I think that's really important. My plow guy, he went up 30% this year. These aren't crazy numbers, and they are crazy numbers. Of course, they're ridiculous, crazy numbers, but they are 2022, 2023 numbers. I'm not trying to defend the budget on the backs of Blue Cross Blue Shield and the guy who removes the snow out of my driveway, but it's there. You know, I just want people to be thinking about that. I want you to be thinking about the people that are working in Morrisville. We are uh, really lucky to have, once again, all the people that are working for us, working for us. They're not making crazy salaries. I met with our HR director and our town administrator this morning. I didn't look at all the numbers, but I can tell you, most of the people in this town are earning less than the median salary for their positions around the state. And that includes communities a lot smaller than Morrisville. If you only, Morrisville is the 25th largest uh, city or town in, in Vermont. If you looked at just those top 25 towns, we'd be way, many of our employees would be way under the median salary. I know this, and I know all this information is not out there yet, but we'll hopefully get it out there. I am, I'm almost done, I'm sorry. It's been a long night. Um, I am liaison to the police department. Police budget's up 20%. I sat down with Jason. Jason gave a great presentation back in December, early January. I forget exactly when it was. Met, that, met with him again. We have, I think everybody in this room would agree how important our police department is. Not only how important it is, but how well it operates. And we need, we're, we need to feel lucky about that. We have a police department that's fully staffed. There's not too many towns or cities in the state of Vermont that have fully staffed police departments. Take your hats off to that guy in the back because he is figuring out a way to get people to work in this town. The fact that we have fully staffed departments, not just the police department, but across the board, is in part driving this budget too because the select board and the town administration has responded to the things that the town has asked for. Was, you know, I come to select board meetings. There's always complaints about something. That's okay. I get it. That's why we're here. You know, we're the sounding board for that. But things are getting done and people are getting hired. Um, in terms of the police department, you know, Jason's asking for another officer. We have from 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. every single day of the week, one officer on. From 2 a.m. to 10 a.m. every single day. We have one officer on, and he'd just like a second officer there. That's driving that budget. We have a drug problem in this town. It may not impact us. I don't directly see it, but boy, I hear the stories. And I know Eric has prepared something to go into the, go into the town report, and I'll let you read it then. Number of incidences in, uh, again, I'm just talking about the police budget right now. I know there's five large components to our budget, but this is one of the things that's driving the increase. <laughs> our number of incidents, we had in 2022, 5,214 incidents. 5,214 times the police department was called to respond and take care of some issue. That's a 27% increase from 2021. And you can't blame all that on the development that's happening, because that development isn't even done yet. Those people haven't even moved in yet. So those are just a couple of things I wanted to say. I, I just, um, couple. We're, we're a couple, <laughs> yeah. And you haven't heard me talk a lot, Tony, but I, I just something that's been on my mind, and I just wanted to get that out off my chest. We're going into the next month. This is going to be really important. We're going to get to vote on this budget the first week in uh, March. Um, I'm glad we're doing it by ballot. I'm sure we'll get a large number out. I don't know what's going to happen, but um, those are my thoughts. Those are my thoughts for tonight. Thanks, Don. I'll take your thoughts, too, and pass. Jess. Um, I'm all set. Thank you. 
Brian. Just want to thank everybody for working hard on the budget. And as far as it's gone, I want to thank Don for what he just said, because I a lot of what he said is just the way I feel too. Uh, don't blame the messenger. Mm -hmm. We're here trying to do our best, and so yeah, like we do have a lot of good help. The one other thing is, we're going to have an informational meeting. Do we have a place to have that besides here? No. Should we? If we're <laughs> already been warned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here? Yeah. Yes. But okay. it's also going to be on Zoom. Yeah. Okay. What's the date on that? Monday, February 27th. Okay. And I'm going to make this meeting longer by two seconds. Ballots will be mailed out by February 15th. So be on the lookout. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's it, Brian? That's it. Thank you. And I'll let Don take my spot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next, community concerns. Who's got a community concern? Tony, come on, come on up. It's past my bedtime. I'm gonna make it quick. You think it's past your bedtime? <laughs> so the whole board up here, except for Don, said tonight that Mooresville is a small town. I did not say that. Okay. <laughs> There's other small towns around, and I've recently read, and I've worked in Waterbury for 35 years, Waterbury's budget, for the same budget things that we have here in Morristown, is $5.2 million. They don't have the police department, but they pay the state, they, they, play, they pay the state police, okay? They seem to be, have a safe community, okay? And then, What's this, uh, what's these funds from American, American, uh, ARPA, the what? ARPA, yeah. American Recovery Plan. Yes. Are we getting those funds too? We did receive those funds. We already received them? Yes, sir. And they're out the door? No, sir. They're in an account. That was, uh, the auditor spoke to that tonight. So, so what did we get for that? We got a million dollars. A million? Because they got 1.7. But it goes all, it's all different. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was all that was all decided way above our heads. Okay. I just wondered, I just wondered what what that was being spent on. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. It's, they they, they put the capital improvements in Waterbury. I, yeah. So it's in an account that is labeled currently the capital building improvement fund. Yeah. The board has opted to use one hundred and sixteen thousand of that as part of our budget cutting measures this year, rather than put the hundred for the phase two construction of the office space upstairs. Rather than add that 116 to the proposed budget, we're using the uh, the funds from that account to do the phase two project upstairs. Yeah, that'll help us. They finish it. It's the second phase of the project. So that's basically all I want to say is Waterbury runs on a 5.2 budget, 5.2 million. Same population, same probably the same square footage of property. That's where I'm at on it. And more so it's 10 million, right? Not quite. But Not quite? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Any other community concerns? Tom. Yes. Thank you. And, and Tom, I, I agree 100% with what you said. And I appreciate you saying that. I was one of the first to say this at those budget meetings. Like a lump of the law that I sat there. Listen to that and never ask a question. I sat there, and never asked a question because I didn't really know what was going on. I, I take responsibility for that. I messed up. I should have been asking questions. I will change. But when I don't understand something, I'm going to ask the question. The people behind me who I can't turn around and look take responsibility for this for not showing up. They have to take, they have to change, they have to get here and ask you the question, like Travis is asking you guys the questions now. In transparency, what I mean is we get answers. You folks have not really put out what's really in this budget except numbers. You do the excellent job of the police department. The police department, let me check this, is up 20%. 
It's a real good explanation of that. However, general, the general uh, government is up 57.7%. What's the explanation of that? When are we going to get that? The highway department's up 44%. Where is that money coming from? What's that going to? You that folks have about. not. It's don't, don't interrupt me. <laughs> I'm almost about to cut you off. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, not tonight. 44%. We're, and you folks have not explained it good enough or even a little bit to us. In your so opinion. we know. In your opinion. I haven't seen it anywhere. Well, uh, that's you, why I'm saying this you is your opinion. opinion. Where you put one article we have the information. and the news hey, Bob, and citizen. Point of order. One yeah. Comments he can talk. We're not supposed to discuss it with him. That's what this whole thing is illegal in there, to be even on there. You have the right you gotta get up and tell us something. But if you want to get discuss something, you get on the agenda to discuss it. Because it's the you open meeting. You've got to be kidding me, Brian. Right. Reading right in the book in the open the BLCT told us that we shouldn't even have it here. And you want to know about transparency. Yeah. There it is right there. Yeah, we like you, to be accused of, right we, we like to be accused of stuff. That's nice. It's very nice. And I've been, I've been on here a long time, and I've been transparent from day one. Any questions that I have the answers to, I would tell you, you're welcome to any meeting we go to. We try to put it on Zoom. We're not trying to put, do things. So like. Everybody else. Have there. you explained this budget? To I, the I can explain the two questions that you have. The, yeah. the fifty-two point, the fifty-two yeah. per percent increase. In the general government has a lot to do, and correct me if I'm wrong. Salaries and health care. Yeah, okay, see. that's inflation, and that's the cost of health care. And then the and the forty-four percent increase in the highway revenue or the highway department um, budget is about fuel oil and about paving costs. How much did they pay in fuel oil? I don't have the it? entire budget in front of me, but That's it's but that is but yes, we haven't got the, the, we we've haven't been, had enough information to form a real uh, educated uh, knowledge to, to vote correctly on this budget because we don't know enough about it. We know the numbers, but we don't know what they are inside. And you had, you've had that one thing, and now you're going to have an informational meeting on the 27th. The ballots are already in people's hands by that time. They're being bailed out 15. They'll be voting before you have the informational meeting. That's what I mean by transparency. I don't believe you guys are behind the walls doing something crooked or you're taking money away. I don't believe that at all. We're just not getting the information. But whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? It's your responsibility. No, it's your fault. responsibility. You're it's a taxpayer. You. you want to know the information. You want to vote on this. Wouldn't you want to find out the information? We Where can send out to? any of this. Call town offices. We'll, we'll send you all the budget stuff. See, everybody's got lazy. we got to serve it to you on a platter. You want me to come to your house and, and explain it to you at your kitchen table? Government, no. I don't think this government, is correct. Government gets the information from the people. The people shouldn't have to come to your site See, to get the information. That's your, your opinion. So we're going to have an informational so, meeting. I think we, we're, this, we're not here to I, I, discuss I, the I'm budget. I'm sorry right. that I'm getting hot yeah. right now. I'll it down. You just sound like a broken record here, over and over and over again. And we, we, it's totally not true. The stuff you say, it's totally bogus. So we all, we all know what's inside that budget. Yeah. Well, you can ask. So, well, you can me, ask. Let, can I just make a point? Uh, of, can, I, can I, can I, can I jump in here, please? Yes. Um, where is the entire budget, line by line, available? Where is that available? On our website. On our website. Yeah. So we have to go to your website. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I do have it. I have it right. Right. Because you've asked for it, because you've gotten it, <coughs> just like everyone else. Does. Somebody gave you the budget. If I'm concerned about that, I, I don't. I, I don't think we should be accusing each other of right. anything. I think the the idea of community concerns is that we're bringing concerns right. and we're hearing them. I, my I, my final, and then I'll sit down and be quiet. I think the board has to change. I think I have to change. I think the community has to change, so that we all get on. The same freaking boat, the same platform, so we are green and get it. Don't hurt the town. We all want what's best for the town. 
All of us got to change. This boy is going to change. I am going to change. And I hope the community changes. That's all. Any other community concerns? You got a hand up to I don't I mean I don't know your board, but I'm assuming they're all volunteer and mm -hmm. I'm paid to be here. We, we, we get we get paid a hundred dollars a month. Okay. Hundred bucks a month, and boy it's worth it. We all have lives, you all you're all tasked with making difficult decisions, so don't think it goes unnoticed. Thank you. Well thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple hands up. Carly was first. Carly, or Kathy. Kathy's on Carly's iPad. Oh. Bob, I do know how you can save money. Is just hire um, people over 65 <laughs> who are on Medicare. You don't have to worry about insurance. <laughs> 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 yeah. Kathy, you had a question? <laughs> You're muted. Reverse ageism. That's right. <laughs> Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, quite a few meetings ago when you s stated that the budget, um, a lot of it increased because of salaries, I started looking. And um, I just think I read somewhere in the last few days that Eric is going to um, ask for a little over 8% for our highway crew um, in the next... Um, talk with uh where but anyways i think people are feeling that it's excessive nobody gets over an eight percent raise every year with excellent benefits excellent vacation all holidays and i just think that people are thinking this is excessive i mean i i hate to say this but Eric's going to have a $40,000 raise in less than two years. That's excessive. And I think that's what people are seeing is it's excessive. So just keep that in mind. That's what people are thinking out there. Um, nobody gets a $40,000 raise in two years. Nobody. So that Neither is am I. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Elon, Elon Musk does. <laughs> and then, Z, is that Zeph or Zeph? Zeph. 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 Hey, hey, thanks for all you guys do. I'll make this quick. I'm just curious how the reassessment is going to affect. I mean, how do we how do we even know how we're going to be affected if we don't know how much our reassessment will be? We don't know. Bob, can I, can I help with that? Yeah. Yeah. The, the appraisal is being finished up as we speak. The books that comes out that has everybody's new assessed property value will be out late April, early May. That's a projection from Nemerick, our contracted company. Those new assessed figures will not impact your taxes until FY24. We have to go through an appeals process. So anyone that wants to appeal their assessed value on their home, so there's a whole process that has to be done, done first. Those new assessed values will not be figured in this year's FY24, FY, yeah, FY24's uh, tax bill. It'll start the following year. Okay. If the budget's $10 million this year, it's going to be $11 million next year. I hope not. Okay, I'll take it tonight. All right, is there any other comments? All right. Thank you guys. I think you do a great we job. Have, we you. have a you, possible executive session. I've got a motion. Okay. I move we go into executive session because I find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. I move to go into executive session to discuss the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee subject to T1 VSA section 313A3 to include the town administrator Eric Dodge. I have a motion by Don. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Judy. All in favor say aye. Aye. We are now, we'll be in executive